Let's call to order the regular business meeting of the Board of Education for Community District 128. To order um, Monday, October 28th. Everybody can stand. And please respect the flag. Please. 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 today. Um, let's briefly review the agenda. We will open it up for public comment. Anybody would like to speak, I'd ask you to limit your comments to three minutes or less, please. Uh, we'll have education presentations and student recognition. Um, we'll have updates from our student school board representatives. We'll have the superintendent's report. We'll approve the consent vote agenda. Uh, and I will highlight one item there. We are going to remove item 3B from the approval of the consent vote agenda and bring that back next time. Um, let's see, then we have brief updates from facilities and finance, program and personnel. Um, CEDAW, anything? Yeah, a little, little update from CEDAW. And then Jim, I Yeah, I just have a brief comment. Okay. And then uh, we are also going to add a closed session uh, tonight. Uh, topic being employment of an employee. That would be 5 ILCS 120 2 c one There will be no action taken after that executive session. Okay, but we're going to convene briefly um, to discuss employment of an employee. All right, anything else? All right, would anybody from the public like to speak tonight? Yep, go right ahead. Sorry, Kelly. Do I need a mic? Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. I don't know if I can do this and read at the same time. I'll try. My name is Kelly Mazurik. I'm a 20 year resident of District 128, and my three children graduated from LHS. I'm also here as a volunteer with Moms Demand Action uh, for Gun Sense in America. Moms is a grassroots, nonpartisan group working to end gun violence that I joined um, shortly after the school <coughs> shooting in Parkland, Florida. I spoke to you a few weeks ago at the PMP committee meeting and asked that you oppose IASB resolution number one at the upcoming annual meeting. This resolution calls for giving school districts across the state discretion to arm teachers, but arming teachers would make children and everybody else in school less safe. This board opposed a similar resolution last year and I applaud you for that, thank you very much. I'm here tonight to ask for your public assurance that our IASB delegate will be attending the meeting and voting no to resolution number one. I won't repeat the facts that I shared at the committee meeting. I told you I had a lot, and I'm, I'm going to uh, pass out some, uh, I'll give you some more before I leave. Um, but like everyone else, I'm horrified by school shootings and feel strongly that guns don't belong in our schools. Our school buildings are meant to be places of sanctuary, safety, and learning for our kids. The presence of guns at school adds an unpredictable element that puts educators and students at increased risk. There is no data that indicates arming teachers will make schools safer. Instead of spending money to arm and train teachers, let's spend our taxpayer dollars to hire additional mental health professionals and school social workers, establish threat assessment programs to understand and intervene when a student is at risk to themselves or others, and continue to implement security upgrades to prevent access to our schools and classrooms. We can all agree that something needs to be done to reduce gun violence in our country and to protect the lives of our children when they're at school. Safety school experts, teachers, many law enforcement professionals, and our medical professionals all agree that arming teachers and bringing more guns to our schools is not the answer. I urge the board and your delegates to continue to oppose any effort that would arm staff or teachers, including IASB resolution number one. Thank you for your time, and thank you for your service to our district. Thank you. Sure, sure, and it, it just and thank you for, for coming to the committee meeting earlier in the sure. month and coming tonight. Uh, I am the, the IASB delegate for uh, this board to, the, uh, to that meeting that will happen later in the month. I can assure you that it's, I, I'm planning to be there, and I'll make every effort to be there, and 
we'll, we'll, we have one more committee meeting to discuss those uh, opportunity to discuss those resolutions. But uh, I can assure you that uh, our my position and our position has not changed from last year, where we opposed that uh, that, that particular resolution. So okay. I will I will do our part. Okay, that's great to hear. Thanks very much. Okay, anybody else would like to speak? All right, let's move on to uh, student recognition. <coughs> Hello everybody, John Gilliam, Principal of Vernon Hills. I have the privilege tonight to uh, recognize one of our fine athletes. So Coach and Lexi, come on up. Uh, Lexi Schulman uh, is the young lady who we are honoring tonight. I'll let Coach talk a little bit about her. I have the privilege of being friends with her parents and her dad, Eric, has been telling me for years that uh, we have quite a golfer uh, coming our way. And so uh, she's a freshman this year. I was able to watch her from afar as she uh, climbed the ranks to where she ultimately finished. Uh, so that was cool. But then I also had the opportunity to play with her in the staff uh, student golf match. And uh, proud to say that we, we tied for first place, five under, nine holes, pretty impressive. And I'm proud to say that I maybe had one shot count and she had just about all the rest of it. So uh, Lexi's a good kid. We're happy to have her uh, as a freshman and for three more years. Coach Steve Downing's gonna talk a little bit more about her. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm the head girls golf coach, as was mentioned, also a counselor at Vernon Hills High School. And I also was hearing about Lexi for probably at least the last two or three years from other coaches and other, other, te other players from other teams. So definitely excited to have her on the, on the team this year. So a few things about her. Um, she set a number of school records this season, and I'll list a few here. And if you're not a golfer, just believe me, these are really, really impressive scores right around par. So her dual match nine hole season average was a 36. Her 18 hole season tournament average was a 73. Her low single nine hole round was a 33 at Vernon Hills Golf Course. Her low single 18 hole round was a 67 at Vernon Hills Golf Course uh, for the Cougar Classic, which is a team we also won. All of her finishes at the IHSA Regional, Sectional, and State are also school records. At IHSA Regional, she placed second with a 77. At IHSA Sectional, she placed third with a 70, 72 in a field of 112 golfers at a very tough golf course. And then at IHSA Class 2A, and for golf, um, 2A is the, are the biggest schools, so that includes Stevenson, Barrington, New Trier. So with the IHSA 2A state finals in Decatur on October 18th and 19th, she placed fifth, which is considered all state. And her scores for the two days were a 73 and a 76 for a total of 149. And Lexi is the first all state uh, girls golfer in the history of Vernon Hills High School by a long shot. Um, and not only is she a terrific golfer, but she's also a great person as well, very easy to coach. She doesn't let a bad shot or a bad hole get her down, and she has the same demeanor and attitude regardless of how she's playing, which in golf this is definitely a very big feat. She's also very humble and does not brag about her scores. She's a good teammate and gets along very well with the other girls. She's also very coachable and willing to take advice, even with how talented she is. So, Lexi, I would like to present you with this All-State Certificate, and congrats on an amazing freshman season. six holes, <laughs> but I had more fun. <laughs> um, okay, very good, well done. Wonderful. 
Um, you next. Uh, best buddies. Well, good evening. I'm Tom Kalenis, principal of Libertyville High School. And uh, I stand up here representing um, not just Libertyville High School, but Vernon Hills as well. Um, because as we talked about um, different types of programs at our school that we are very proud of, um, we thought about programs we would want to educate the board and our community about. And our Best Buddies program was one of the first ones that came to mind. Um, we have a very remarkable and um, awesome Best Buddies program at both Libertyville High School and Vernon Hills High School. Tonight, you are gonna hear from the two co-presidents of the Libertyville High School Best Buddies. The Vernon Hills Best Buddies president was invited as well, but she's out sick today with a cold, so hopefully she's on the mend. But um, I'm gonna introduce two seniors at Libertyville High School. Maggie Hutchins, come on up, Hi. is one of our co-presidents, and Colleen Mullins, is our other co-president. Both of them are seniors. And they're gonna share with you some information about Best Buddies, but also um, some information they learned at a state, at the uh, statewide Best Buddies conference that they actually, at Libertyville, came and shared with our administrative team about uh, ways um, that we could design and create programs in our school. And so they knocked the socks off our administrative team there we learned a lot from listening to their presentation, and we wanted them to have the opportunity to share it with our community this evening. So without further ado, Colleen and Maggie. Yeah, you can pass it around. Absolutely. Okay. Hi, I'm Maggie. I'm a senior, and I've been a part of Best Buddies since my sophomore year. So first of all, thank you guys for having us today. Colleen and I are really excited to talk to you about something that's really close to both of our hearts. Um, like she said, I'm Colleen and I'm also the co-president this year. I was president last year as well and I have been involved in Best Buddies all four years of high school. <laughs> so Best Buddies is an international organization and this is its 30th year um, as the organization and it focuses on four main goals, which are one-to-one -one friendships, integrated employment, inclusive living and leadership development and at Vernon Hills and Best in Libertyville High School Best Buddies we focus on one-to-one -one friendships. So this kind of goes into how the Libertyville chapter works and I'm not sure exactly how it works at Vernon Hills but it should be in a similar model. So the term that the Best Buddies International Organization coined for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities through this club, our buddies. So part of our club is focused around our buddies. We have three amazing faculty advisors this year, the presidents and vice presidents of our club. We got two over there. <laughs> and we have our board members as well and our peer buddies. Peer buddies are non-disabled peers who want to be really involved in the club. And what they do is they go through an application process and they're matched in a one-to-one -one or two-to-one friendship with a disabled peer. And also we have our associate members which are non-disabled peers who want to be involved in Best Buddies, but aren't matched in that one-to-one -one friendship, and it's less of a time commitment if they have a busy schedule. We have all chapter meetings every other Thursday, and so things we do then, last Thursday we had a Halloween party, and so everybody dressed up, and we played different types of games like freeze dance, and we also have board meetings once a month, and those involve planning the different events we do throughout the month, and we also have peer buddy events where both the buddies and peer buddies are invited to an outside of school event like laser tag or bowling. And so the overall mission of Best Buddies is to pro promote inclusion and is to establish a space where people can form friendships with um, people other than themselves and get to know each other better. So like I said before, Vernon Hills and LHS, we focus on one-to-one -one friendships. So as Maggie mentioned before, we have our peer buddies and we also have our best buddies officers who also apply and go through an interview process. Um, we also have a peer buddy training before our peer buddies are matched with their buddies. This just um, is so we can go over the disabilities that um, some of our buddies in our club have so that we know how to interact with our buddies um, and promote inclusion with them. And just for disability awareness, expectations of being a peer buddy and um, also just helpful tips with them. We have a match party, which these are some pictures up here from, 
and this is when um, our peer buddies and buddies find out who they're paired with, and it's always a super exciting time. And we have peer buddy events, as Maggie mentioned before, which is when peer buddies and buddies all get together in a group and um, hang out together, and then the, the peer buddies also hang out with their buddies outside of school on their own. Oh. Um, <laughs> We also do a lot of fundraising throughout the year to raise money for our super fun activities and like our Best Buddies Carnival that we put on every February. And one of the fundraisers we're doing right now is this awesome t-shirt. And it's actually on the web store right now, so if you want one, you guys can go get one on the web store. So one event that we do that is in conjunction with both the Vernon Hills chapter and the Mundelein chapter is our Best Buddies prom. Here are some fun pictures from last year. And so Vernon Hills actually has hosted the past couple proms, which has been wonderful. And I'm currently working with the Best Buddies president at both of those schools to try to combine our clubs more because a lot of the buddies are friends with the buddies from other schools from their outside activities like Special Olympics. So we're trying to figure out fun ways to get everybody together in a larger group every once in a while. So switching gears a little bit, um, we're now going to talk about, Colleen and I are both part of Integrated Gym, both last year and this year, which is a PE class offered at both LHS and Vernon Hills High School. And yeah, so we're going to talk about why we think it should be called Inclusive Gym. So I, as Dr. K mentioned, I attended the National Best Buddies Leadership Conference over the summer. And in one of the meetings, we discussed the difference between the word inclusion and integration. And that's something that really stuck with me because our gym class that we do here is my favorite class of the day. It's so much fun. And it really is an inclusive space. And I thought the name should match that to demonstrate the kind of environment we're trying to set for everybody. So this is the graphic that they showed us at the conference. And so the green dots are the people who would be considered the majority. And the different colored dots would be, in this case, the disabled peers. This model can also apply to a lot of other situations, but for now I'm just going to use it in the Best Buddies context. And so in an integrated space, you can see the buddies or the kids in the special education program are invited to join gym class. They're in the room, they're, doing, they're in the same space, but they aren't necessarily doing the same activities. They're all lumped together in a different group, whereas that inclusive um, bubble at the top, which is what our gym class is right now. It really is an inclusive space. Um, everybody's doing the same things. Everyone feel like they can contribute. So some examples of how our integrated gym class is an inclusive gym class is, so last year we had a couple, a couple of my friends had muscular dystrophy, so they were in wheelchairs. So when we did the basketball unit, they were not given an alternate assignment. They got to fully participate and score points for their teams. And the way we did that was our wonderful teacher, Mr. Gorris, had bas hula hoops hanging from the basketball hoop so they could shoot at a lower range um, and still score points. Um, also, we do the but Butler Lake Walk. I'm not sure if Vernon Hills has something similar, but we do that. And you'll notice if you watch us walking, it's not just Colleen and I who are in a lot of the same classes outside of Integrated Gym walking together. It's everyone's really mixing and mingling with people um, who are different than themselves and it's just not really bunched up by people who you already know. And then when we play tennis, my personal favorite, there is a couple of the buddies who are in integrated gym class. It's a new space being outside playing tennis. Sometimes it's new and overwhelming. So a lot of times one student will want to go to the far court and be not as all up in the action. And there's always someone who goes and joins him so he can rally back and forth, but not in such an overwhelming environment. And so that is an example of how it is this first bubble here and not the second one. So it is an inclusive space. So up here is the definition of inclusion and integration. Um, as you can see, the definitions themselves are actually pretty similar. However, as Maggie mentioned before, the applications are not similar. And as she said, our gym class is very inclusive because our buddies and um, our teens without intellectual de developmental disabilities are all interacting together. It's no one in separate groups. Everyone's together. So they really are different. So here are some examples of how the applications of the two world are different in the gym model. Um, and it can be applied to other spaces as well. But in an inclusive setting, there's a commitment to working alongside non-disabled peers. Everyone is engaged and encouraged that everyone has something to contribute. 
and there are the same activities for everyone, whereas the opposite in an integrated model, in an integrative space, um, the buddies would have to adjust to the system, the system is not adapted for them, and they're not getting the same experience. So they'd be separated, doing a separate activity, they wouldn't be able to play basketball because those hula hoops weren't there, so they'd be just tossing a beach ball back and forth off to the side, which is not getting that same gym, super fun basketball experience, and like I said, there would be separate activities. So when I was looking for more examples of how to phrase the difference between an integrated space and an inclusive space, I came across this really interesting article from the California Department of Social Services. And so some of the keywords that showed the difference really well is the inclusive um, example is boxed in yellow there. And so in an integrated space, it's implying that there's something wrong with the minority and that they need to change the way they function in order to succeed in the regular space. And the child is just going to school. They're just going to gym class. Whereas in an inclusive space, all, it's recognized already that all children are different and it is, the class is working to meet the individual needs of all people and they're participating in school. And I really believe um, that our gym class is already doing that. The curriculum does not need to change at all. It's just the name needs to match what we are accomplishing. So in the convention on the rights of persons with disabilities, um, the United Nations purposefully chose the word inclusion um, for, to illustrate their global goals for persons with disabilities, um, not integration, which shows um, that inclusion just really is the correct word to use here. So I truly believe from my experiences at Libertyville High School that in, we are an inclusive school and I'm sure a lot of people from Vernon Hills would agree that. Vernon Hills is that way as well. I've seen inclusion in many places besides Best Buddies. I know Libertyville has started a new equity team this year, and so I know a couple of my friends received little letters in the mail that gave them, if they clicked the little box on the PSAT saying they ident identify as Latino or Hispanic, and so they got a letter in the mail that let them know all the scholarship opportunities they have going into college, and there's also Random Acts of Kindness Club, which I'm involved in, which is also working to make our school a more inclusive place. So Libertyville is very inclusive, and I'm very proud to have attended here in the past four years. And yeah, so that's why Colleen and I are here to talk to you about the difference between integration and inclusion, and why we love Best Buddies so much. Thank you. Does anyone on the board have any questions for us about this? Can, can you introduce the other folks that are here? Or can they introduce yeah. themselves? <laughs> Hi, my name is Rachel Bond, and I'm co-vice president this year. I've been involved in Best Buddies on and off since freshman year, and I've been a peer buddy since junior year. One of my peer buddies, or one of my buddies actually goes to Vernon Hills now, so I've been able to meet a lot of new people and make a lot of new friends, which has been an awesome experience. My name's Lexi Hogdahl, and I'm a senior. And I became involved with Best Buddies last year after hearing all of their great experiences. I wanted to be involved. And last year, I just had such a great experience. I'm now a board member, and I'm also a peer buddy. And like Maggie said, I'm also in Random Acts Kinds Club, and we're vice presidents, presidents together. And I am just, I think we all agree that inclusion is just a great word for this. The program is so amazing, and it just is such a great experience for everyone involved. Does anyone else have any additional questions or comments about the whole concept or what Best Buddies is doing at either of the schools? Great, great presentation. What is is there a follow up? I mean, you're you're if I understand, you're asking that this course be changed from integrated gym to inclusive gym. Is that yes? So. Um, that's one thing I wanted to highlight that I think, um, and I hope you as a board are very proud of, is that when we do curriculum review and curriculum um, audits, students and community members are able to contribute to that process. So the students um, came to me with the proposal, and now that proposal is going through a formal process where we have to look at the name that's proposed. We met uh, these um, students, Maggie, met with the PE chair and her teacher and talked about that. She came and presented at our uh, building leadership team meeting. 
And then um, we're looking at, we have uh, limitations on the names that we can use for classes because of it has to link up with state approved titles so that there's unification across how you name something. So we're doing that research right now. And while inclusive PE might be a challenge for us in the short term because the state doesn't have that name approved, we're looking at um, ways that we could incorporate that into a title or contact the state about ultimately creating that so that we can link to it. Is that a fair summary of where yeah. we're at? Definitely. Great. I mean, my, my comments are, once again, I, I always admire seeing these kinds of presentations because we do spend so much time focusing on, I'll just call it again, reading, writing and arithmetic stuff. Uh, and I'm so proud of you guys for these things because this is a lot of work to do this and I admire your passion and, you know, I, I just, I'm amazed at what, you're, what you do and I just think it just sets you up so well for all the things that you're going to face once you leave, leave LHS or VHHS. So you guys should feel, feel very proud of yourself and what you're doing. And I'm all for taking on the state if we can't fix this. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd, be I'd be happy to work with, with you, okay. you know, work with our legislators, have, work with ISBE. Go ahead, Rhea. We, we are actually on the schedule to talk about that tomorrow, and there certainly is some flexibility oh. with what the, the Illinois course code says and what we're allowed to do as district. So Great. you'll probably be some, seeing something at the November committee meeting. Our committee, our normal committee normal meeting. I was going to say, if not, just send these two young ladies down to Springfield and they'll continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So again, let's make sure it's, it achieves what we want. I mean, this would be one I'd say, let's not settle. If we got right. what we need to, great. Yeah. If not, bring them on. I was just going to thank you for not only uh, educating us about the program, uh, but I, I can't let the opportunity pass to also thank you for doing something that is so consistent with our daring mission and our vision for what this district is all about, not only for when you are here in school, but what you will take with you and what all the participants will take with them out into the world when they become global citizens. So thank you. I just, I just also wanted to say, um, one of the things I really appreciated about this is the just the idea in our culture right now where words are thrown around and often very carelessly that this just really shows that words matter. And even in a case where it's not like there was a bad a word that was wrong, and it's just there's there's a better word. Let's use it um, and let's think about that with the words we use. And always be open to uh, hear that you know there's a better uh, maybe a better term for that or a better way to think about it. So thank you so much for already being aware of that and bringing that uh, to you know for us to. And that was the other point I was going to highlight in closing, is that this, um, this graphic, which Maggie and um, Colleen presented, sort of um, shows an evolution in our society through history and how historically we may have excluded, we excluded different populations of people, and then we moved to segregation as a nation, and then integration. And um, while now I think our students are leaders in leading for using our daring mission and being on the forefront of creating inclusive environments. And so after they presented to our leadership team meeting, some of our discussion was where are we as adults identifying areas where we're integrated and where can we move for greater inclusion? And I think what you may hear from us, whether it's other students who come in or different staff members, are the numerous areas where we are as a district talking about equity and inclusion for all of our students and some of the ways that that may alter and change some of the programs, classes, clubs, activities, and sports that we offer. So this is definitely a work in progress and we were just ecstatic that um, in this case, like in many others, our students are leading the way. And again, it also shows the value. I think you said you went to the, um, was it a national conference in the summertime? Yes. I mean, what a, what a great thing, right? Yeah, it was really cool. There were. Thank you. Um, I got to meet so many people from the, basically with the presidents from every single chapter, um, or almost every single chapter in the entire United, United States, extending into Ireland. I know some people from Hong Kong were there. Super cool um, to see how, I didn't even know how widespread this club was. Um, I really only knew the Libertyville view of it, that the one-to-one -one friendships were going and play, playing laser tag and painting pumpkins. Everything's great. I didn't know they offer opportunities for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to become motivational speakers and find um, employers that 
are accepting and all these other really interesting values. So can I ask one other question? Sorry to this on, but I'm mm -hmm. not, this just piqued my interest. Because uh, it clearly chose the right co-president. So how did, they, how did they choose you guys to be co-presidents of this? So Colleen was president last year, and then she put in a nice word for me to be president this year, and then I went through an interview process as well. But do you want to talk about that a little bit? I mean, yeah. <laughs> so um, when I was a freshman, and I um, immediately became involved with Best Buddies. And sophomore year, the first year I could join the board, I did. And I was actually the only underclassman on the board. Everyone else on the board was a senior, and then there was just me, the one sophomore. And so I kind of like automatically, everyone wanted me to be president because um, I was the only one on the board that was eligible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it was kind of an automatic thing well, for good me. Good for us, you were. By the <laughs> yeah. Right, 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 right. Um, yeah. So then, still stands, by the way. Yeah. So then I um, was president again this year, and more people applied, and yeah, Maggie was amazing. So. She also became president. It's much easier having two presidents. There's a lot that goes into it. Um, so Colleen and I, when one of us has a test tomorrow, we'll kind of switch it back and forth who's going out and buying toilet paper to wrap each other up like mummies and things like that. So yeah, it's fun. Great job. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. All right. Thank you. All right, equally as inspiring tonight, we have our updates from our six distinguished <laughs> Student School Board representatives. You guys want to start? Okay. Uh, okay. Um, AP exam registration for first semester and full year classes was earlier this year than in previous years, and students have now registered and they're able to pay for their exams. And students that are taking second semester only classes will register during second semester, so they don't have to register right now. Also, the musical Mamma Mia had a successful run this past weekend, and there are only three shows left. One is a special performance on Wednesday, October 30th at 4.45 p.m. for senior citizens in the community, so you are all invited to attend that day. Um, also, the Cougar... <laughs> Mr. Huber, why did you look at me? <laughs> Dr. G told me to say that. funny, <laughs> Um, also, the Cougar Class Act Award ceremony was on October 11th, and congratulations to the following recipients. Jocelyn Aguire, um, Ella Blaker, Nicholas Burroughs, Luke DeLorme, Samuel Ginster, Aaron Hernandez, Alvin Johnson, Nikita Kabalkin, Julia Martirano, Owen Ray, Ricardo Sotelo, Caden Tran, Emily Vasquez, and Shayna Weinstein. On October 16th, we had a special Daring Day. Freshmen attended the Wright Assembly, which stands for Respect, Integrity, Trust, and Experience. The students worked with senior leaders as well as staff in small groups. They then joined together in the auditorium to listen to speaker Mike Donahue. Freshmen were also given the opportunity to share personal stories they had about overcoming adversity in their own lives. Overall, it was a very impactful day and a great bonding experience for the class of 2023. The sophomores heard from a mental health expert who discussed internet safety. They were also introduced to Cello, which is a college program, so that they could take assessments to help them place into college and career interests. Juniors had the option of taking the PSAT, which is also a national merit scholarship qualifying test, in which many juniors did take advantage of. Seniors were able to use this day as a college day to meet with English teachers to work on their Common App essay or supplemental essay for specific universities and um, they were very thankful for that opportunity. This Friday, November 1st, is an early action deadline for many colleges that Vernon Hills students are applying to, and we would like to thank Mrs. Bolito and Ms. Fuentes in the CRC for all the help that they provide us seniors. One special note is on October 8th, us reps from Vernon Hills spent the day at Libertyville High School shadowing the reps and their schedules, and it was interesting to see a larger school than Vernon Hills and the different <coughs> dynamics in the hallways or in classes. We really liked the tour of the school where we were able to see the auditorium, the backstage area, various classrooms that they use for different um, curriculums, and the new pool. Overall, it felt very similar to Vernon Hills with some minor differences. And we'd like to thank the administrators and teachers for allowing us this opportunity to experience Libertyville for the day. And we'd like to thank the Libertyville community for being so welcoming and kind on our visit. 
I'm going to start off by talking about all of our sports. So starting off, congratulations to freshman Lexi Shulman for earning All-State honors by finishing in fifth place at the IHSA Girls Golf Finals. It is an amazing accomplishment, and we look forward to seeing what else she does in the years to come. Rohan Vasudeva also made it to the state finals for boys golf, so congratulations to him as well. Girls Cross Country recently earned their fourth straight conference championship. They have won every year since joining the CSL. They also just won the St. Viator Regional Championship with four runners earning medals. Our boys runners made it to sectionals as well. Good luck to both teams as they continue their season at the Fenton sectional on Saturday. Congratulations to the girls tennis team on winning the Vernon Hills IHSA sectional. It was the first time in school history that all six sectional qualifiers made it to the state finals. What a great season for them. Lastly, boys soccer just captured the Deerfield Regional title. They play again on Tuesday for the sectional semifinal. Good luck to them. Ms. Fuentes and Mrs. Polito, along with Spanish-speaking students from CLC and an admissions rep from the University of Illinois, presented information about college to Spanish-speaking families this month. It was a very informational presentation all about this stressful college process, and it was very helpful to everyone that went. Two PE field trips took place recently. Mr. Regani and Mr. McKelly took the junior and senior leaders to Covenant Harbor in Lake Geneva to work on their team building skills. The junior leaders found it to be a good experience to practice being out of their comfort zones, and the senior leaders enjoyed reconnecting with each other and brushing up on their leadership skills together after separating to lead their individual classes this year. Outdoor Adventure 2 went on a camping trip to Devil's Lake with Mr. Maselli. This was a great opportunity for them to practice their skills that they learned in class in a real life scenario. VH Give Ambassadors presented a lesson last Friday called VH Give Thanks. The message was all about expressing our gratitude to those who mean the most to us. Students took time to reach out to teachers, family members, friends, or anyone else important <laughs> to them to say thank you for the impact that they have made in their lives. The lesson really touched everyone. Students in human, human anatomy and physiology had the opportunity to watch a live stream of an open heart surgery through a program put on by the Museum of Science and Industry. As they watched, students were able to communicate with everyone in the OR and had the opportunity to ask them questions about the surgery itself, what it takes to be a surgeon, or different career options in the medical field. It was a very interesting and immersive experience, though many students winced at the sight of the patient's chest being cut into. Okay, so congratulations to chemistry teacher Ms. Tao on being selected for the University of Chicago's Outstanding Educator Award. Each year, entering first-year students are asked to nominate an educator who has influenced them, challenged them, or helped them along the path toward intellectual growth. They receive letters from hundreds of students inspired by teachers who have changed the course of their lives, who taught them to reimagine text, to dive deeper into problem solving, and to think beyond the borders of the classroom. Our homecoming participation this year was amazing. We had over 100 seniors participate for Powder Puff. The homecoming dance had 894 students in attendance. This week could not be successful without the support of our caring staff and amazing buildings and grounds crew. BHHS Wind Ensemble and conductor Mr. Sondel have partnered with the prominent band composer and arranger Dr. Paul Noble to produce recordings of many of his newer works. Middle school music students came to BHHS to play with the high school musicians. BHHS hosted its career fair where organizations able, were able to set up booths in the field house and students explored different career paths during their classes and study halls. There were also breakout sessions where speakers gave presentations on their respective careers and answered student questions. Two of Vernon Hills math teachers are using a unique grading system being called Standard <coughs> Grading System. Last year, Mr. Pardon assigned categories of skills such as mastery, approaching mastery, progressing, and beginning to assess each student's level in his pre-calc and calculus classes. The idea is to focus the learning on understanding rather than grades. Students in these classes, including myself, received no points or percentages on any assignments or assessments. While this may seem beneficial to some, other students seem to be uncomfortable with the idea. They grew anxious about not having any number grades in power school and all masteries instead of an A with a more specific evaluation between 90% and 100%. However, this year Mr. Perdan has adapted to a similar system that Mr. Cornese, also, who is also teaching calculus, is using. The two teachers now use a grading scale of 10 points on assessments. When students receive text, tests back, they will not receive points earned or taken based on each question, but based on the overall test instead. This means there are no points attached to each question, but the teacher evaluates the mistakes and give a score between 1 and 10 accordingly. This is beneficial to many students who struggle with, t with having points taken off on basic minor errors in previous math classes. 
Under this system, the goal is to show a well-developed understanding of the skill and learning target rather than to focus on grading points for each question. This October, our school magazine, The Scratching Post, released its first issue of the year. Students in journalism classes worked hard to create this issue. The October magazine featured news articles about senior quotes and, feature, and a features article comparing LHS and Vernon Hills High School spirit, school spirit cultures. We are excited for more issues to come. Um, so we're also going to start off with our visit to Vernon Hills High School. Um, so this past Tuesday, we drew Libertyville reps to travel to Vernon Hills to shadow our reps there. Um, we were able to observe the life health class, consumer management, AP Spanish, journalism, speech, and psychology. Um, we had a great experience there throughout the day and had many positive things to report back. Um, to hone in on one class specifically, we really saw the daring statement in action in the journalism class. Their teacher led activities that encouraged students to be more aware of what their own stories told and what stories they were covering um, and whether or not they were capturing stories that were also really different from the perspectives that they themselves hold, um, which we really appreciated getting to see. We also noticed a couple of things that are different than how things are run at LHS. Um, for one, we noticed that the classrooms were set up differently and um, for one thing had a lot more desks and chairs that were rollable, which we felt like created a more collaborative environment. Um, at LHS, a majority of classrooms still have normal desks set up in rows, where, or excuse me, set up in rows, um, whereas at Vernon Hills, more desks are facing each other. Um, while LHS is currently in the transition to introducing more of this dynamic classroom-like material, um, we look forward to seeing that continue on a wider scale. Another thing that we saw was the consumer ed requirement. Um, at Vernon Hills, everybody is required to take a consumer management class or a personal finance class in order to graduate. Um, whereas at LHS, economics also fulfills that requirement. While we, um, when we observed their consumer class, we felt that the content that they covered was extremely valuable and feel that LHS would stand to benefit from a similar policy of not um, including economics in fulfilling the consumer requirement. When we raised this question to other students at Libertyville, one common issue that we heard was that by allowing econ to fulfill the consumer requirement, students are pushed to take an extra AP class when they may not otherwise need it um, because it can somehow be a GPA boost. Um, but just to sum up the day as a whole, we really appreciated the opportunity to get to spend time with our Vernon Hills reps, um, to grab another lunch with them, and to meet all the teachers and staff at the school. Um, so for a few school ongoings, um, on October 16th we had the Daring Day. Um, juniors were at school to take the optional PSAT, and the other grades got a chance to participate in this year's Daring Day. Um, freshmen and sophomores participated in a variety of activities, such as the Art Impact Project and Growth Mindset Activities. Seniors got the day for college preparation of their applications with help from the CRC and the right place. A few English teachers were able to stay in the MASH until noon, um, where many seniors got the chance to have one-on-one -on -one essays help, essay help, which was widely agreed upon to have been very helpful and much appreciated. People in sports and theater still had to come to school for regular practices and rehearsals, um, which was met with mixed opinions. It was tough for juniors who had the PSAT to go to a practice before the test, um, naturally, um, and it was also tough if they were exhausted after taking the test to go to practice. Um, but some people stated that they found it nice to have something to get their day started, um, such as a morning practice. LHS also started their annual canned food drive, and all the canned goods brought in will be going to the Libertyville Township fan Food Pantry. LHS is known for being a major donor to the food pantry, and we hope to keep the momentum going. One major change from last year is that the competition to see who can bring in the most cans is between grade levels rather than between second period classrooms, and this brings a fun spirit of unified competition to the school. So LHS also kicked off their annual WISH program last week, and WISH leaders debuted some changes from last year. All classes will receive small families instead of being able to choose from different size families, and the date for purchasing gifts has been moved up to be earlier th in the year, and advisors hope that this will increase organization and efficiency. Everybody is so excited for WISH season, and it's many students' favorite time of the year, so we look forward to all the fundraising and bake sales that are soon to come. Um, French Exchanges from, forgive me if I um, butcher this, Andres and Renoir <laughs> came to LHS for two weeks to experience American culture. And this is the second part of a French exchange program in which um, LHS students went to France in the summer. And they visited museums and other attractions in the city. Both the French and American participants have expressed extremely positive experiences with the program. Senior Maddie Coons explains, that the French exchange program was super impactful for her personally because it really immersed her into, into a different culture in a way that's never happened to her before. And beyond just teaching French culture and the language, 
it taught her how to take risks and not be afraid while learning a new language because she's just trying to communicate with others. Um, moving on to sports, LHS had their last home football game on Friday, and the theme was Rock Out. The varsity team won 43-22, to qualifying them for the state playoff, and we're so proud of them. The boys' soccer team won their last game against Mundelein, 5-3, and this was their regional championship. Tomorrow they're going to be playing against Palatine for the sectional semifinals, so we wish, them the, we wish the best of luck to the team. The girls' varsity tennis team got 8th place overall at the state tournament, and the girls' cross-country team won 1st place in varsity regionals on Saturday in Lake Forest. We're so proud of all of our athletes and all of their accomplishments. On to clubs and activities. Our Model UN uh, went to the Washington University Model United Nations Conference in St. Louis, and since the group got to take a school bus to drive there, they were able to stop at a couple of sites along the way. Junior Drew Benoit and Senior Drew Hopkins both won awards, and for many attendees who were there for their first conference, they reported having a great first experience. LHS went to Homewood Flossmore and Schaumburg debate tournaments with outstanding successes. At Homewood Flossmore, sophomore Kate Gerber and Sarah Dowden um, both received awards. At Schaumburg, our very own senior Kat Corliss and juniors Cheryl Jacob and Zaina Kazi and freshman James Monahan won, also won awards. Cats Against Hunger, formerly known as Libertyville's UNICEF Club, hosted a successful Spikeball fundraiser to raise money for Thanksgiving meals for those in need, raising $200 in total towards their goal. And Libertyville's Environmental Action Force is planting a garden in the courtyard. And they're planting the whole thing with native Illinois plant species, so they're currently cleaning the non-native grass plants and will begin planting this native species in November. The school is extremely excited to see the finished courtyard and the prospect of, for another outdoor classroom in addition to the one that junior Jake Short created for his Eagle Scout project. Um, <clears throat> on to, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> on to fine arts. We have this year's school musical All Shook Up. It had two amazing performances on Saturday and Sunday. Um, this year's show is performing for two weeks, which is super, super nice. So it gives two more chances for people to see the show on Friday, Friday and Saturday this weekend. Last Friday, the cast of All Shook Up went to see Vernon Hills' musical, Mamma Mia, and um, Vernon Hills came to LHS on Sunday to see All Shook Up. So it was super cool seeing um, both schools, theater programs kind of connecting and um, meeting each other. In orchestra, we had the Fright Night concert on October 17th in the gymnasium. Um, we spoke with senior Isabel Greenberg um, about the concert, and she described it as unlike any other orchestra concert um, that they perform during the year. They get to perform pieces from spe specific subsets of music. Um, the director, Mr. Marino, also continued the tradition of being carried onto stage into a coffin and jumping out dressed as the Grim Reaper. Um, we want to congratulate the orchestra for all of their hard work and for a great concert. In ILM MEA, um, 32 students from choir, band, and orchestra have been selected to participate in the Illinois Music Education Association District 7 Festival. More than 100 high schools um, participate in this audition-based festival, and it's the highest individual honor a student can receive, so we're extremely proud of the Wildcats who made it. In Health and Wellness, we have Red Ribbon Week starting up this week, and it's all about the awareness and prevention of use of drugs, tobacco, and alcohol. This year's LHS students have expressed in the Red Ribbon survey that they want more information on vaping and how to help others with vaping addictions. This week there will be stands outside of each day at the lunch and um, having information about all of these different topics. And this Friday there will be the annual health fair in the library. Snowflake training in partner with Vernon Hills High School has started, um, happened uh, last week and they are ready for this Friday to meet with the middle schoolers. Um, the achievements um, that we have had um, this month is that two LHS students have been recognized in the National Hispanic Recogni Recognition Program. Grace Henderson and Mark Plunkett scored top 2.5, scored in the top 2.5% among Hispanic and Latino um, students 
for the PSAT test takers in the region. So congratulations to them. Great job, you guys. Okay. Yeah, I actually have a question. Yeah. Oh. yeah, no, I actually have a follow-up. Go right uh, You said something very interesting in that for El Libertyville, actually mm -hmm. can't say this, and that is we allow a economics to pass for consumer finance or personal finance or consumer ag. And frankly, I'd just like to understand how when that decision was made, this probably goes, how that was made, because I'm I'm pretty certain that personal finance or consumer ed is a lot different than AP economic, macro or microeconomics. 100% different. And I, I hate to see people go bankrupt in life because they didn't have a basic financial class because they were so concerned with the GPA. So can somebody just at least help me understand? So first that? of all, Vernon Hills, Vernon Hills has the same okay. requirements. So if you, students who take AP econ here are they fulfill that graduation requirement multiple ways. One of the ways is through an, an econ class, AP yeah, econ in this class. And that requirement, what's that so requirement? So that's a state, that's a state level graduation requirement. Okay. So it's fulfilled, like, like I said, multiple ways, and there's three that we have in the district. Uh, it's been that way forever. Yeah. And it's a common practice in many districts that AP economics fulfills that graduation requirement. So it's not unique to Libertyville High School yeah. or District 128. But no doubt, they're, but, I mean, they're, yeah. they're considerably they different to curricula. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but they all fulfill that same requirement, so. Do we have to allow that? I mean, I guess my question is, do we have to allow that? Because Just because it fulfills something doesn't make it necessary. And again, we could always debate it later on and as a, at a committee and things of that nature. But at the end of the day, when we have kids who don't know how to balance, write a check. One, okay. Two, balance a checkbook. Three, do a job interview. You know, those are pretty important life skills. And, it, and again, this is just me. As a per we talked about this when I came on the board about being a total holistic student. Auto, shop, consumer finance. We don't just need to take 19 AP classes to be successful and to be deemed successful, in my opinion. And I'm glad you said something because it sounds like, I, what, what do the kids feel though? I mean, that's, that's what's important because, you know, we are, we're always, the race to success always thinks GPA, GPA, GPA. How about checkbooks and their job interviews and things like that? Um, I'm currently in the consumer class and I actually have found it very helpful because my teacher has taught us a lot about budgeting and uh, what taxes and insurance is like. And something I wanted to add is that um, when the LHS reps came to our school, Maya noted that she took consumer last year as a junior, and at Vernon Hills it's only offered as a senior course. And in talking, we think that it would be a really good option to offer it as a junior course as well, because for example, we just did a unit on setting up our FAFSA accounts and all about um, how we can plan to save for college. And a lot of students will take consumer second semester senior year, and by then it can be a little bit too late to start planning for that. So if students get the opportunity to learn those skills earlier in their high school careers, it could be more beneficial for them. Yeah, and um, I took macro uh, my sophomore year back when it was just macro and not econ. And when I went to Abby's consumer class, like I just noticed that there's so much that you miss out on when you take econ. Econ's obviously an interesting class, but like I will admit like a vast majority of my high school career, I have been very caught up with you know, trying to get the best grades and the best GPA because, you know, that's always seen as the path to college, but there are so many just life skills that you miss out on when you're not in a class like that. And, like, honestly, just one day in that class, I learned a lot <laughs> that I just didn't know before. Yeah, um, I have to be completely honest. Um, I, like, I was one of the many people that took uh, macro, like, in the last semester that I was offered as a semester course because, like, I was really, um, blinded by the GPA boost that it offers. I really have no personal interest in econ. Um, I just found the exposure interesting. But a lot of students that I've talked to um, have said that they also took econ because like, they found it a beneficial class like, for their GPA, even if they aren't personally interested in, interested in it. Um, but like, after having taken the class, they may not have felt that they got as much of a personal benefit out of it as they would have if they just took consumer and um, like address the fact that like it might not be as much credit in their GPA. Yeah. 
I'm taking AP Macroeconomics second semester of senior year. I decided to take that because I have an interest in pursuing a business field, so I am applying as a business major in college. So I feel like AP Macroeconomics would be the best option for me. Personally, as a senior, it's been really hard to fit all the classes I want into my schedule, so I really do not have space for another class. So it is extremely beneficial to me and other seniors that economics fulfills that requirement because there's physically no space in my schedule for a consumer class. Okay, so I, I just I think this is awesome. All right, one more comment. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Um, I have a very similar view to Ella. Um, I agree that econ really does not go into those life skills at all. I'm in AP economic AP economics, which is a full year um, course right now, and I am taking it because I also want to pursue a major in business. Um, and I would not have had room to take AP economics in addition to a consumer class. So it, I think it's, for me, it was personally helpful to have it fulfill that requirement. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to take all the classes I'm interested in because my schedule is so packed. But I agree with all you guys that it is important to learn how to balance the checkbook and all of that. I think uh, a couple of things. I think that throughout the depth of the discussion here really indicates why the state allowed economics to um, you to take the option of taking an economics and getting your uh, consumer requirement. We haven't have always had a consumer requirement in the state. I mean, you know, for like 50 or 60 years. So that's been an addition at the state level at some point. And so to balance these, those two things, I'm sure after a lot of input from schools uh, across the state, the students, they allowed, as they do in some areas, an additional way to get that credit for those of you that may not be able to fit uh, that into your schedule. Also, for students that are in the fine arts, if you're taking band or orchestra or choir, and you're taking a, a fairly rigorous uh, student program, there is no space in your schedule for other electives. There's just no place to put them. Um, so that becomes um, perhaps problematic um, as well. But Kevin, your point is still well taken in the world that we're living in today. For kids to have that basic knowledge, as you guys have talked about, and some of you have seen and visiting, uh, those classes becomes you know very important. So, Rita, I don't know if you have anything else you want. To add. Um, you know, I think what what we're hearing what we're hearing tonight from students is exactly why we've talked about the need to include students on our uh, curriculum review there committee, and we have plans to do that as part of daring uh, <laughs> to continue to look at all of our offerings through the lens of what our students tell us and. It, it certainly is true that uh, they don't all speak with one voice, just like we heard tonight, that what works for some students doesn't work for others, but considering their needs and their voices as we make these decisions is increasingly important. And I, so again, that, this was awesome. I, I think this is probably the 15th class of student reps we had, but this is the kind of interchanging feedback that I think we have been looking for for a fiscal year. Yeah. So thank you for that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
maybe as juniors and seniors instead of just for seniors, it would be a really good way because it sounds like people are just struggling to fit it in their schedules and giving them more of a like flexible time to take the class might be more beneficial. Okay. All right. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and Pat, before we go on, I think, you know, as Rita indicated, as we do our curriculum review process and including student voices, so we'll be able to share some of those conversations with all of you at, at committee meetings and then maybe highlight some of it here um, moving forward. Um, and that's going to be pretty cool, as we've already seen tonight. We didn't really plan for the dialogue tonight, and the dialogue has been great. So. That'll be a lot of fun, I think, to watch that develop. And by the way, these, I mean, these are the kind of discussions, like, you won't believe this, but it won't be too long from now that it'll be springtime, and you guys will be handing off the baton to the next six people. You know, I would ask you to make sure they're aware of their, the full breadth of their responsibilities, which is bigger than just telling us what's going on in the high school, okay? I mean, it, it includes all these things about, you know, what are, the, what are the gaps that you see, what are the things you wish from a student perspective you wish we could do. Because the worst that we're ever going to say is no can do, right? But so far, I'm seeing a lot of very good follow-up, all right? So wonderful, <laughs> wonderful job. And okay. if I could just walk, yeah. offer congratulations yeah. to Kat on your debate award yeah. <laughs> and you. to Ella on the Cougar Class Award. We're Thank very you. proud of you. Thank you. And kudos to both schools. I mean, uh, I know Don and I were at Mama Mia. I wasn't able to get to the Libertyville play, um, but the talent and the two high schools is just unbelievable. Um, and it's just so much fun to, to watch. We're still at this weekend. So yeah. <laughs> and let it be known that some of that talent actually goes on to bigger and better things. Yeah. As the okay. proud mother to my left would, would, uh, would, would uh, yeah. probably be willing to share sometime. So great training for your future endeavors. All right? Thank you. Great job. All right. You guys are free to go. I'm sure you have other things to do. Oh, before you go, uh, we have some, so I think, social studies students with us, probably history? History? Government. 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 So why don't you stand up, because we see several of you at every meeting. And these are, and what, are you all from the same school tonight? Libertyville. Yes. All from Libertyville tonight. And who's your teacher? Mr. Duffy. Mr. Duffy. I have Brent. Mr. Duffy. Who do you have again? Brent. Brent. Laura Brent. Okay, great. I as well have Laura Brandt. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, well. I did it, actually. And do, and do you see how we did this? Now you're on video because we tape the board meetings. So nobody can question your signature because you will be on tape that you are here. So, okay, yeah, you guys can. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming. Good job, ladies. Uh, uh, you know what? You, you look, you're, you look as comfortable as you like it, right? for a dull moment. Okay. Next. Um, I think it's me. Uh, let me just do two others. Okay. All right. Number one. Yes. Yeah. All right. So uh, two things. One, uh, the committee meetings are November fourth, so they're early this month because of Thanksgiving. Uh, I hope to get back in time. I will not be here for lunch. All right, so anybody, the board who, reps. anybody who would like to volunteer to have lunch with this inspiring group, uh, let me know tonight. We'll make sure Carol knows who's going to go. All right, these guys are they're fantastic to eat with, actually, um, because all of the enthusiasm you see tonight carries right over to the lunch table. Um, and, and it's a lot of fun. It's 11 30 a.m. at Baker Square. So just yeah. let Pat let me know that you want to hang out with us. And if there are more than one, you can do that too. We'd have, be happy to have more than one. Yeah. Okay, second thing, I think everybody got a copy of the uh, schedule for the tri-conference with all of the presentations and stuff. I would like to bring that to probably PNP or whatever one of the committee meetings just to coordinate who's going to what, okay? Uh, there's a bunch of us going. Uh, there are a whole lot of things. Many of them are often at the same time. And I just want to make sure we don't have five people at one thing and nobody at others. So if you could look at, the, at your um, agendas kind of highlight the things that you think are worth somebody going to, and then we can have a brief discussion and just make sure we get the right coverage, all right? Because there were a number of good topics on there. There were a number of safety-related topics. There were some on boards and board governance and all that. Um, but I just want to make sure we kind of divide and conquer. And, uh, they have yeah. all those things on Saturday? Yeah. Saturday's kind of the main day. 
Saturday, 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 Friday, Saturday, Friday are the, Friday or the are the half days or all day, right. kind of the pre, that's, that's kind of almost like a pre-conference. Yeah. And then um, Saturday, when those of uh, you that have been able to attend have attended, you've really picked out what you want to go to on Saturday, and depending on how long you can stay on Saturday, if you're staying all day, or if you're staying over Saturday night, you, you do the half day on Sunday. So uh, yeah, Saturday is kind of the main day. And then um, Friday, Carol will put the schedule together Friday evening uh, for us. So yes, we can talk about that. Let's just talk, because I looked, there were a lot of good things, and there are a few things I'm sure that all everybody's going to want to go to, all right? And so we'll have to just kind of draw straws and see how we split up, OK? Um, but it'll be a pretty good agenda overall. OK, next, superintendent's report. The rest of this just seems so routine after the first part, doesn't it? It doesn't. I can't even make it sound more exciting. So um, anyway, except the student recognition. Well, uh, this month is a special month. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand and tell me if you know why it's a special month. But this is actually National Principals Appreciation Month. And so um, we always do this at the board meeting. And we have, happen to have two principals in our school district. Uh, and I just want to say again, uh, really, the board already knows this, of course, but on, on behalf of us um, and to our communities, that we have two world-class principals leading our two world-class high schools. And we're very blessed to have them here. Um, we appreciate the work uh, that they do, um, leadership and, and management, and then working as part of the district team as well. Um, and this district could not be better positioned with the leadership it has uh, at our two buildings, as well as the district office, of course. Um, so uh, Tom and John, we have, Pat and I have a couple little certificates to give you just as um, a way of appreciating the great work that you do for us. And just know I'm speaking on behalf of all of us how much we appreciate both of you. So congratulations. <laughs> student school board reps feel very comfortable bringing things up and, and making their feelings known okay and, and I believe that doesn't just happen everywhere all right so I really want to give you guys and, and really everybody in the administration but you two guys in the building in particular credit for establishing a culture okay that that I think is really just feeding our students I mean I, we know technically how good you guys are what you do and and, and we can't understate how important that is. But what's really impressive to me is what, what you've been able to accomplish from the standpoint of creating a culture where our students, I think, you know, I'll say really feel like they can thrive, okay? And, and to see them today to really kind of look to you guys and say, well, you know what, but this is how we really like to see it. I just don't believe that happens everywhere. And, and I'm just really proud of you guys for being able to do that. So I just want to add my thanks for that. Okay, everybody else? Okay, uh, so we can we continue with uh, good news. So District 128 has received a Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting from the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada. The award is given for the district's comprehensive annual financial report, which we refer to as CAPR, and is the highest form of recognition in the area of governmental accounting and financial reporting. Its attainment represents a significant accomplishment by a government and its management. Congratulations to Assistant Superintendent Dan Stanley and his business department on this achievement. And great job. Uh, the district, yes. uh, the district 128 Special Olympians have been very busy this fall. On October 5th, two D128 Special Olympian teams uh, competed in the unified soccer sectionals in Elgin. 
with the Storm Black team winning gold and qualifying for state by winning its division and the Storm Orange receiving silver and receiving an at-large bid to join them at the state tournament. Both teams will now be competing, competing at the State Unified Soccer Tournament in Schaumburg on November 2nd, so that's coming up uh, this weekend. Storm Black team members are Liam Angelos, Celia Gomez, Jillian Johnson, Libby Karsten, Sean Karanen, Joey Leach, Chase Miller, Chris Morosen, uh, John O'Connor, Willie Kroshotsky, Gabriel Reyes, uh, Richana Bencott, and Mackenzie Rimke. Steam team <laughs> Storm Orange team members are Anthony Berthold, Bridget Bulletin, Alexa Donato, Nathan Ferrara, Albina Gisa, Noah Hewitt, Joseph Maller, Jack McDonald, Danielle Parnes, Anna Scholler, Kylie Spitek, and Nicole Spitek. On October 6, 17, or 17 of our Special Olympians competed at McHenry West High School in the area bocce ball tournament. At the end of the day, six D-128 athletes qualified for the state tournament to be held in Bloomington in June. Those athletes were Mackenzie Runke, Hope Michelotti, Libby Karsten, Drew McCarthy, Steve Bogoyevich, and Noah Hewitt. Six D-128 Special Olympians will compete in the upcoming sexual bo sectional bowling tournament to be held November 2nd in Rockford. The sectional qualifiers who qualified at the regional tournament held in June in Addison are Alexa Donato, Haley Dunbar, Nathan Ferrara, Joseph Maller, Chris Morosen, and Vincent Ra Roberts. So congratulations uh, once again to our amazing <coughs> Special Olympians and the coaching staff. LHS swimming coach and retired teacher Greg Herman was named a 2019 inductee to the Lake County High School Sports Hall of Fame and was inducted into that prestigious group on October 10th. Don, with his long um, coaching background and participation in swimming, is knows Greg well. I think you guys would consider each other very good friends. Uh, competed against each other and know each other well, and Don uh, wrote Greg a really wonderful note of, of congratulations. So, um, you know, Greg's one of the good ones. So. Great job. Members of the LHS Model UN team traveled to St. Louis to compete on the campus of Washington University. Drew Hopkins received outstanding position paper and honorable mention. His position was Titus Kalinius, uh, Quaster in the Joint Crisis Committee, Second Punic War Rome. Andrew Benoit received verbal commendation. His position was Anne Hidalgo, Mayor of Paris, in La Republic. In Marshall, uh, Council of Ministers of France 2017. The team was accompanied by advisors Kara Bosman and Matt Wall. And the District 128 Foundation for Learning has announced this year's recipients of the Alumni Achievement Awards Jessica Chiarella from Vernon Hills High School, class of 2005, and Sarah Potempa, Libertyville, class of 1999. They will receive their honors at the big event November 8th at Mickey Finn's in Libertyville. Mary, did we have a slide tonight that you wanted to show? Okay, if we can get Stuart to pan around to that, just a reminder for the community, the Foundation's big event is, in fact, Friday, November 8th, from 7 to 11 p.m. at Mickey Finn's. Uh, this is a great event. All the proceeds go to uh, benefiting um, innovation grants and students in need. This is a major fundraiser for the foundation, and in the past 10 years, the foundation has given out well over $300,000 in innovation grants, has been in, and really has been the tip of the spear of innovation in the district, over and beyond what the taxpayers give us. Um, so uh, we really hope to see everyone um, there that evening. Okay. Uh, next on the superintendent's report tonight is proposed 2020-2021 school calendar. Uh, Rita has spent uh, several meetings just reviewing uh, the calendar after many meetings and much input into the calendar. So um, we are uh, recommending uh, the 2020-21 calendar as uh, proposed coming out of our October uh, committee meeting and we would need a motion, a second, and then a, a vote. 
Okay, is there a motion to approve the proposed 2020-2021 school calendar? Rita, I have a question, and apologies for not seeing this earlier and just really drilling down on it. What is the rationale behind the grading day on January 4th? Isn't that traditionally the last day? That, that would normally be Friday the 18th. Yes, um, we uh, spent quite a bit of time on this calendar to attempt to more evenly balance the number of instructional days, first and second semester. Um, and uh, you can see that, uh, that they, they are in balance still. Uh, and so one of the solutions that was presented was to move the grading day to January 4th. We had a lot of conversation about that and input from uh, through a survey to the educators and uh, there was widespread support for just moving that day uh, to January 4th. Was that on the calendar that we saw mm -hmm. in committee? Yes. yes. Yeah, and I, again, I apologize for not seeing that. So you're essentially gonna make those kids wait two weeks for feedback on their final? Is that, that's what that's telling you? Yeah. For next year. And that'll be communicated take, early. Yeah. Well, I get that, but you're, you know, that's a long time to have them wait for their grades. I have to be honest with you, I don't know how comfortable I am with that. I would agree that it is a, um, it's hard to understand the benefit of simply balancing the days between the semesters when the trade-off is making the students wait for two weeks for their grades. Well, if I understand correctly, the alternative is one less instruction. And first yeah. semester, that's correct. No, there's right. a whole day of instruction. It gives yeah. one more day of instruction in semester one where there's already an imbalance between semester one and semester two. Yeah. When we moved final exams several years ago, when we finally moved final exams before the holiday, because the rationale for that is we used to do finals like in the second week of January, so we had better balance between the two semesters. One of the other calendars that was discussed, if you just look at the way the break falls, was you know breaking up the following week, and there was widespread disapproval for that solution as well. So we did we did review quite a few options um, to address this, but this was the lesser of the evils in the minds of those who participated. We did have parents on the community uh, on the committee who weighed in in regards to this solution too. Um, I don't love the idea you know, I, I think they're great being an extra day longer either. Like getting into the habit of doing an extra day over <coughs> holiday break. And correct me if I'm wrong, but, yeah. but some of the flux in all this really is when like certain years are way more complex to try to figure it out because of when things fall. I've seen that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. On the it's not necessarily yeah. said, you know, like, precedent for from now on every year is going to be this, but once in a while there are funky things you have to do to, you know, yeah. at least by, is by determined by determined by all the different people weighing in, and as Rita said, it's kind of the lesser of, I mean, nobody thinks that's ideal. But were there both students and parents on this committee? There were not uh, students on the, par on the committee, but uh, parents. And, um, and that is something that we incorporating students into the calendar committee is uh, another wise move to make, um, given the fact that they are the most impacted by the decisions that the committee makes. Um, there are a number of districts that uh, schedule an institute day on the day after the return from a holiday um, or, or at the start of a second semester. That is kind of a common practice to extend um, for that. So it's, it's not unusual to have right. a day to do school business on the day after a holiday period or at the start of the second semester. I understand the concerns um, in regards to students waiting, um, and that, that was discussed. Um, uh, I'm sorry that I did not catch that. Yeah, yeah, me, too. me too. I, 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 I really, I wish we had discussed it in committee because sure. that would have been the appropriate time to ask our questions and express our concerns, so I apologize for bringing it up now. What is, what is the it. practical reality of this? I mean, really, is I mean, will teachers wait until after the holidays to get the kids a final exam grade? I mean, I find that a little bit surprising. It may or may not. I think the conversation at the building level is is what uh, when Power School is open and available, with what the results of those are, and that is something that we can uh, continue to discuss related to this change. As I can teacher, imagine, the I would grade grade want grade. to have all of my grades done before the break was over and then use that day to prep for second semester. Right. Yeah. 
which will probably be what most do, but the system, the way it's set up like this, the system, our school will be shut down. Until because there oh, may well, be some teachers that you sure. not to, be so you have yeah. to yeah. right. So yeah, most teachers right. will probably have their grades done, but the communication of said grades will not happen until power schools opened up at the end of that grading day on that Monday. The, the other thing at a high school level, and I've worked in for five different districts um, over my career, teacher all the way now to superintendent, is there is often a day after you come back for break. Because at the high school is different than the elementary school because of many semester classes. So teachers are changing um, class loads. Uh, so they're getting schedules, they're getting counselors are doing schedule changes for second semester. All those things that we used to be able to do, kind of when we're running, when we had finals in January, we had a two week period running up to that and we just kept going after that. So there's often a prep day um, at many high schools in the first, uh, in some school districts, the first two days. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the students are waiting that two weeks to get their grades. Right, right. That's, 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 we're gonna get two weeks. Yeah, that's, that's, that's two different things. Yeah. But the, the issue of the balance in the semesters is a big issue to the teachers, right? And, you know, we went through a 10 year process here to get to the point that um, we could move semester exams to first semester, we got a little more comfortable with that balance. But as you also know, we don't take most of the school holidays anymore. And part of the reason is to make sure that we're balanced, getting closer to balancing the days, you know, between first and second semester. So that's a big deal for, um, you know, in a year long class, you can make some of those adjustments. If you're teaching semester classes, which a lot of high school classes are, and you have that semester class first semester and semester class second semester, that creates a, the same class second semester, that creates a big difference if you've got eight, nine, 10 days in difference of what you're actually covering in that class with those students and you're able to do that. So that's the accommodation. So that one day is kind of a big deal of instruction, particularly given the imbalance between the two semesters that we Because it really so, puts them off by two days. It, it, yes, it, it does. Days one, and one semester it loses one to the other. Right, which exactly, is, which makes the imbalance, yeah, it's kind of a double yeah, whereas and, and, and so, <coughs> I'm, you know, I have to keep in mind is the, the fact that until we changed the uh, finals to before the holidays, they didn't get their grades until the second week in January. Mm -hmm. So they didn't get their, their final uh, grade for the first semester until then. Well, but they took the finals and got their right. response the within right. a day or two. That's so, so that's what I'm trying to understand on this power school thing. So how was it before? I mean, what do you mean? When they had the finals in January? The power school has always been shut down during uh, until after the grading day is complete and all the grades are in. So, so they have their grade on that Friday before yeah. Christmas. And, and then, it's, they, then it's open up. But day. the grading day was the Friday, like the day before Christmas yes. or something? They, before the winter break. Yeah. yeah, so they would still have an additional day on the, on the holiday break. It was just and, and when you say power school shut down, it just, you just mean it's, it's not open to the, yeah, 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 you can't ask. It, it yeah. is this year unique because you do have a full week, you got a full week with Christmas in it here. Yeah. Um, okay. All right, so, well, let's, let's, um, well, let's wait for a vote, and vote whichever way. Well, and, and before we go there, remember, as Rita has recalled, recounted again, and in case of you sat on the committee for a long time, that there's a lot of this, all of these options are discussed, and the reason we have parents on the committee is so we can, you know, have their opinion on this. And as Rita has noted, it's the best of maybe the worst evils, I guess, in terms of trying to make this work. And this will be about communicating to people. We're gonna have a change next year on the calendar, and it's a result of ABC. And so this is what going this is what's going to happen, and we're going to tell you in advance. Okay, it's not perfect, um, but it's it's the best perfect of all the options that we had to look at uh, to try and save the integrity of that particular day. I'm guessing the conversation with the Wednesday before Thanksgiving happened, and that meeting of what they yeah, didn't that screw stuff up even more then? That takes another instructional day. Oh, so, so well, no, it does. Yeah, right. Well, that's why. That, that is in the contract, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Yeah, but that, that's, that's a, part of the discussion that's we had with, right. yes. Yeah. 
Okay. So that screws it up even more. Well, so again, if you look at this over the last two years. Right. Yeah, to more. Yeah. Right. yeah. So part of, part of all this is an accommodation for all of the factors that we've kind of highlighted maybe two weeks ago and we highlighted again tonight and that Rita's worked through with um, the committee. So yes, that Wednesday before Thanksgiving is a contractual um, issue, mm -hmm. you know, at, for at, at least the next three years. And every year going forward, you know, we're going to have to look at the contract, we're going to have to look at the calendar, continue to do what we've always done is look at it holistically, because in a year or two, it gets tricky again around the holidays. So um, some of you, your kids might have still been in high school, we had to do split week. Split week. All right? yep. Or we were going to be out the day before Christmas. Okay, think about that for a minute. So we had to split the week. So we didn't go out Monday because of the way the calendar fell was either get out the day before Christmas or split the week and go a little bit earlier. So we had like a Tuesday to that Tuesday. That was one of the drafts Tuesday. considered with this calendar to address that issue as well. And yeah. uh, the, the feedback from both the <coughs> community members and staff was that very strong. Yeah, very strong against Splitting. splitting that. I will say that we also, um, you know, we condensed new teacher yeah. meetings to one day to um, get students starting as early as we could, given the desire to keep that first week of August available for families who want to take vacations at that time, because that's the week when there's no summer school and there's no practices. And right. So, you know, there were a lot of concerns that went into this being the solution that we arrived upon. I I am well aware of how hard you work on this yeah. and how much time is taken. And that, and I mean, again, I, I, I guess you end up with things that are less than ideal. Yeah, I'm just thinking back to my own student and yeah. no, how, I appreciate that. Yeah. like, yeah. literally, she'd be on power school waiting to yeah. see and to ask her to wait two weeks is kind of unfair. I, yeah. I, on behalf of the students, I don't, I don't love. But I understand that this is the way that this worked in the. Well, we are contractual obligations to the teachers union, um, but I don't love it. Yeah, but our only two alternatives would have been to one, split up that week right. and take Monday as a great day, or B, take out yet again another instructional day from first semester. Or take from first semester. Move everything into the first week of August. Yeah, the only week. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. that's true. Only when we talk about like rest and having a, that's the only week that is true. Sports, and there is no, there's no way the students can find out what they got on their final exam without power school being up and running. It's not right. like college days, they hang on the wall and they right. just take out the last three digits and so screw right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that yeah, the we issue there is that the desire for you to finish. Many of you guys may not remember that. Um, <laughs> some yeah, some students know how to finish, but others might not. So even if you were doing that, like hanging on the wall or whatever, it wouldn't be a uniform way of students in every class receiving yeah. their, their okay. grades at the same time. Well, my, again, my guess is we're going to get plenty of feedback on this, and I, I guess I would treat this as an experiment, and we'll see. We, have, we made decisions based on various trade-offs with input from various stakeholders, and we'll see how this goes. Conversation about final exams continues and their impact on scheduling and, and yeah, on student health and well-being. So we're continuing that conversation. Yeah, yeah that's it, the bigger... It surprised me, and I brought this up at our, that, you know, that, that actually the why did we have final exams was start, starting to be thrown into the mix at our last. So that that was not, not a surprise to you, I'm sure, but no. it was like, oh, what? So um, there's lots of things swirling around, for sure. So is there, is this like a tax levy we have to approve this tonight? Because I'm not so sure I'm going to give you a yes vote, and I, I don't know if I've voted no on anything in the last two years. Are you good to stay? I could, but I... I mean, I guess I wish we dismissed six important people that certainly would have had a lot to say about this. Uh, I'm kind of with Casey in terms of, I know one of my kids will have a nervous breakdown. I know one of my kids will be appreciative and thank you so much for two weeks <laughs> of buying time. And so at the end of the day. That, that very well may be the state of the, uh, the topic. I, 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 here's one thing I'm willing to go out on a limb and say. We will not make 100% of the people happy on this one. Well, yeah, again, I, I, think I, think, I think, I'm, I guarantee you, every, if you survey the kids, I'm, even the students who may have a little risk of 
push back from home, I still think they want to know because those every kid at Liberty Bowl or Vernon Hills puts a lot of time into trying to be as you know, best they can, and they won't get that feedback. I mean, how would you like to give a presentation and say we'll get back in two weeks? No. So I would. You would have. I don't disagree with that at all. I guess I'm saying let's assume that happens. So we get with the kids. We get six out of six kids. I want them to grade before Christmas. Okay. So now what? So we're going to either take yeah. an instructional day out, or we're going to come in on Monday. Well, here's, Pat, here's my concern. Or, or maybe there's a, what, maybe we have to send it back through the process, basically. And there's been hours and hours and hours of, of hard work by a lot of people on this committee that then we sort of back to, back to them, back to square one, to, to go through that process. Because, you know, we're one group. We have to approve it. But they did the work to come up with this. So I think it's, it's only respectful to have them then re- Evaluate whatever recommendation we have. I, I, would, I would agree, um, and I, I appreciate that comment. I think that's an important comment. Um, and I wonder if instead of taking the vote tonight, if we challenge the committee to see if there still isn't maybe one other option, would it be possible to come up with a different result that the board could unanimously support? Or is what you have presented truly, there's not going to be a different option that, that if we challenge you to come up with another uh, a scenario, I, you know, if, if that's I, not really going to be fruitful, then I don't want to ask I'll you to do a lot of more. respect yeah. for the, the, right. the, the time and all of the thoughtfulness that has gone into this, because I certainly wouldn't pretend to know better than the people that put this forward after hours of collaboration and discussion. Well, I'll just provide a little more background. So we did look at, I would say, four different versions of this over multiple months. Um, we started looking at this last year, so we've been reflecting on this for, since last fall, really, we started looking at this calendar and we've reviewed it four different times. Um, the grading day of January 4th has been on there for feedback to the community members and to the staff over those multiple months. And so um, while we certainly could take another go at it, and we did have some versions of it that didn't have grading day on January 4th, uh, this is the one that the committee recommended after those multiple months and multiple calendars. So, you know, we're open to doing whatever you suggest that we do. But the background is that we, as you know, we did do quite a bit of work to come up with this particular version. Um, that doesn't mean it's written in stone. My, my only additional comment would be, I would not want to change that uh, at the risk of further imbalancing the two semesters. I think that's got to be the, the most important piece there. So. To clarify, so one to Kevin's specific question, there is no um, call it legislative requirement that we approve this tonight. Is that correct? No, and there is also no requirement that we don't come back and modify this after it is approved, which we've done in the past with you. Okay. All right. But so let me, let me just ask that other question one more way. So what are the implications of not approving this tonight? Are there any really? Let's let notice for planning to our sender schools um, and to our community. Although in reality, so the sender schools typically they are most impacted they, they by wait, our they vacation. Wait, they wait for us, but they're looking for our vacation period. Our vacation. So whether the vacation started Monday or started some Friday, spring break. yeah, spring break right. is really the one I'm saying. But if the students don't come back until Tuesday and they end up yeah. mirroring that, then a family could be. You know, they can make their holiday plans around that, depending on what the feeder schools do. And I would say that the, you know, the one solution that would fix this is splitting the winter break, and that would have a, a huge impact on families in the community, and that is the least favorite of the drafts that we reviewed. So splitting the winter break um, by starting the winter break a bit later um, in the midweek uh, is not something I think that would gain approval. Well, when you say that. splitting the winter break, what would that mean? Because if I look at the calendar, that if we started the winter break on, say, the 22nd or the 23rd, we could have grading day prior to break, but we wouldn't begin break until midweek, which is not the solution that was. But if grading day was the 21st, are students there that day? So to the community, no. it's like no impact. It's an impact oh, on no. our teachers. No. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So I mean, I, the voice in the community is going to be fine. Just give me my grades before Christmas, I'm afraid. But, okay. Um, 
No, I'm not. I'm not rallying for that solution. I'm just saying the community is probably going to say work Monday. Right. Okay. Uh, hmm. And I can tell you. I, I mean, I, look, well, if we're not ready to vote on this. I'm more than happy to push it and say we'll come back and finish this. All right. Um, well, the only me, thing is, I, I'm not sitting here seeing a better solution. That's the problem. And, and that's you know. I'm not seeing big harm in delay. If it takes a little bit of a delay to get everybody to wrap their heads around this and fully, you know, study it and understand the implications, I'm personally okay with that. I'm not trying to ram this through. Uh, I'm just saying, just from what I hear, it was well thought out, and any of the other alternatives have some significant disadvantages. Okay, now, you know, I kind of go to Don's point. I mean, I'm not, I'm not convinced that all our teachers are going to wait until the fourth of January to come back and. There's going to be some that have that last Friday final. But me as a teacher, I would have two Wednesday, two uh, Thursday, one Friday. If that were the case, then most of my grades would be done and students would know their grades before they left the break. And that's why it seems like a lot, some of this we're just hung up and we got to lock down power school, right? And is there any flexibility on that? I mean, I when does I power school lock down? Start of exams. Start of exams. Yeah, yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. The teachers have full access and can see grades. Yeah, just you can't you can't get into it until they're all posted up. So if you did your grades, but Lisa didn't do her grades, right. Kevin went on and checked your class, and it goes, well, what's wrong with Mrs. Right. Hessel? You know, she doesn't have her grades posted yet, and she doesn't have to have them posted. Right. Of course, she would have them posted first. Yes. I get that, Lisa. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, the alternatives are not great. And just, I wanted to make one comment about the split week. We had to do that. And it's Five probably the split week is for me again. It's pro pro when vacation starts Tuesday. Starts Instead of getting the finishing week. up on Friday or Thursday, you know, the week before, uh -huh. and then Saturday, Sunday, that following Monday, break starts. So instead of doing that, you start like on a Wednesday. You lose a weekend. So you go yeah. Monday and Tuesday, you lose a weekend. Too. So you go like your first day off is Wednesday and you come back in two weeks. Well, the parents didn't like that for planning. The elementary feeder districts hated it, right? And we were trying to do the same thing. So the feedback from them, what I've done and Rita has done, at this time of year, they need to do their planning. They need to do exactly what we're doing. So they need to know what we're doing. Right. So they need to know when the breaks are, you know, when our kids are gonna be out at the high school and so we have tentatively but it's again three weekends, basically. From my yeah, understanding, it's, it's exactly. people in the community want three weekends. Right. But the, when we split the weeks, those were student attendance days that we split. Like they yes. did, the students came Monday, Tuesday. Right. If yeah. you shift the grading day to that Monday, that doesn't really affect the students, it affects the teachers, which I realize is an issue. I'm just saying you're not talking apples to apples with that. Sure. We can, the teachers, Yes, it's contractual. Yeah, um, we we could certainly review all the concerns that you've expressed at our district leadership team level and come back with this on November fourth at committee if that's what you prefer. Um, I, I mean, we've had such an awesome focus on mental health and wellness for our students. I can I can only speak for the ones I had, and I had across the board academically. It would have been a mental stressor, a big mental stressor to ask any of the three of them to wait two weeks for feedback on their finals because of the time and energy that they've been, the emotional, oh my God, the emotional that goes into some of that. Um, asking them to wait two weeks for feedback on that is, is a, a big mental health stressor. And I think, we're, I think we are not sending the same message with Although, although respectfully, I, I respect that point of view, and I, I don't deny that that's what's out there. I can, I, I can see my own kids doing the same thing, right? I mean, my, I can remember vividly my youngest daughter when we were going through this, and she was running to the computer all the time. Part of me looks at this and says, and maybe this is the chance we get to say, don't worry about it. You're going to find out on January 2nd. Somehow, in a way, I, I almost feel like, you know, these guys are talking about taking classes only for the point of GPA, all right? And every once in a while, I go, well, maybe this is the example. Is it's not going to matter, because you're going to find out in January 2nd, and you know what, in January 2nd, the, the world's still going to be here. 
And so there probably is a way to, I'll call it, spin this thing in a way to get them to appreciate the bigger picture. Talk about that around the but I understand it's not going to happen easily. Yeah. My college yeah. students wait two weeks to get their grades. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But let's do this. There's still a lot of conversation that I don't feel comfortable bringing this to a vote. Um, okay. I don't want you guys to feel like this is rented. I, I, I don't want to discredit the good work that was done by this team. I'm not sure that I see an alternative proposal that is better. Um, but I think there's probably some benefit in allowing this to sink in a little bit. Or again, you can take a vote. Honestly, Pat, you guys can take a vote because it's my I'm bad. You've given me this thing 19 times. Yeah, no, I think so. I, I and again, this is not the most thing I've ever It doesn't matter. Some of us vote no or abstain, and we move on. And you know, that's another thing too. So whatever. Well, and look, the the other thing is, we could vote on the calendar tonight, okay? And we can still have some discussion about. The, I mean, we can still go back and, and have some sense. discussion about the grading day. I think. If you were to say to us tonight, um, look, our concern is more about the kids getting immediate feedback on their grades. And remember, we kind of all brought, we kind of all been brought up in that system, right? Where we take something, we get immediate feedback, or we expect immediate feedback. So this change would require communication, right, to do that. And the reason, part of the reason the kids are going is because that's the way the system has always been. Right, so you take your finals on Thursday, Friday's a grading day, and by Friday you get your grades, so you know that. So my kids did the same thing, you start going on the computer, you start looking because you know that. Uh, moving forward, if you were to say to us, look, we understand the imbalance in the semesters, now I will tell you up front that, that teachers will, would probably not be tremendously supportive of that, but if you said, we think it's more important that the kids get immediate feedback on their finals, so, you know, go ahead and eliminate one instructional day because we think that's the greater good. Well, we can do that. We can make that, we can make that fix, right? I mean, we can do that. That's See, that, would, that would be one of the requirements I'd put on. Is I would say any other solution we come up with cannot remove an instructional day. We've had that conversation over and over and over again. I would not. Because it is the double that Jim talked about. It's not only you lose one, you lose one first semester, you're adding one second semester, right? Because now January 4th, or January 2nd, I think it's the fourth. But the reality is that is, that is essentially losing an instructional day on the first semester class. I don't think any of us want to see that happen, but I wonder if you went back to the committee and said, the board wants to unanimously support your recommendation. At this point, they don't feel like they have unanimous support for this recommendation, and they're asking, is there one more scenario? It's very challenging. And it's not meant to be insulting. I, I, and I echo, again, the same apology for not catching this so we could have discussed it in committee. Would it be possible to, to respectfully ask, is there one more conversation about having the grading day not be on January 4th without losing an instructional day? Is that possible? Yeah, I you, need really to, you need to be honest because you've looked at all these options, and if there's not another, if there's not another option that you see out there, we just need to say that. Yeah, I mean, I, given the parameters, the seemingly the only solution would be to have the grading day on the 21st, which would. That's kind of what I'm saying. Yeah. Would lose the instructional day. No. Oh, no. split, split, but it would be. It would be. It would cause the teachers to work not the day when everybody else yeah. had a day off. Yeah. And again, I mean, that's so the, the only. The trade-off tra 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 I'm assuming would be they might not have to come in until the uh, fifth. Right. 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 They would not have to yeah. come in until the fifth because that yellow day would move to. Yeah. I mean, there'd be no reason to add a purple day on it. Now, again, I'm not saying that's a good thing either because you get you must. You know, it's right just now. awkward the way the whole thing is. Sharon, go ahead. And, and there are times when it does that. So we're not asking anybody to be bothered by that as a teacher to say that everybody else is going to get yeah, those three yeah. extra days. Yeah. You would or wouldn't. Yeah. That would bother me. Yeah. Well, who's getting, Even the, though who's getting the extra days at the student? Well, no, because well, other you, would, you would have to come back to work on that following Monday if you're a teacher or an administrator. You would be back in the building. If you're going to talk about moving right. the 21st to the reading day and then taking the 21st and putting that on the 4th, yeah. 
That would be an awkward conversation. And if you had, we sometimes get this because many of our teachers have spouses that are also educators, so they work in other school districts. Yeah. And so they're trying to partner up travel plans and vacations, and, and you have one that has to come in and work, and they can't be off if they have to work. So and it doesn't always work evenly, but we also hear, uh, you know, educator child care concerns when our when our sure. breaks are different mm -hmm. from the breaks that their children have. I don't think that it's ideal that the students will have to wait two weeks. However, it's not feedback, it's a summative grade. There's nothing that they can do about that grade. It's a semester grade. Mm -hmm. So it's not like they're gonna get feedback and then have an opportunity to change because the semester's over. Mm -hmm. So I think that if I had to go to my students and say, hey, this is the way it's gonna work this year. So we got a little year that way before, but you're just going to have to wait until after break before you get your grades. Some would be disappointed, but I think they get it. Okay. Uh, so we've had a lot of discussion. I guess you know the question I would like feedback on is: Is there more discussion to be had here, or are we just you know kind of aired it? They're aware of it. To Prentice's point, we could take a vote. And uh, we can go back and say, look, can you help us address this issue? And it's either A, I think how we have to position this and prepare for it, because it is what it is, or is there some alternative either on the calendar, which could be modified, or not on the calendar, but some other way we can manage this so they can't get access to power school until on the Monday after, after the holidays. Um, it does sound like there's legitimate concerns. I'm, not in any way, shape, or form trivializing the emotional I'm willing to wait. It seems that you want to you wait talk, to. I don't know about. But wait, you're willing to. I said I'm willing to wait to let them look at it if they come up with a better solution. But well, again, we can always modify the calendar. I think the, I think the decision that we can vote on this and you can vote, vote your time. We don't have to be unanimous. Let's be clear on that. Okay. Um, we see how the vote goes. Uh, and. It either passes or fails. Even if it passes, we could come back and say, but we want you to take another look at it. Um, Which we would do, I mean, of course. But, but we as a board, just we can accept the recommendation of the committee or we can vote it down, right? And I can say, well, I like a split week, so I make a motion to accept counter as is, but go through the 23rd of December's instructional day and go through January 6th. You know, I'm making this stuff up, right? right. Yeah. And, and still giving right. everybody two weeks off. And, but you don't get three weekends, I'm sorry, you only get two weekends, but if yeah. you, because we've heard that curriculum days are important to the teachers, and rightly so for those teachers that teach only half semester classes, because I guess that would be the only ones that really this impacts the curriculum days, Most, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, right. If, if, right? So, I mean, at the end yeah. of the day, I, I've never heard the discussion before, but and again, I might not get reelected on this platform, but if you really think you need three weekends off, over a winter break, well then, okay, I'm not your guy. I think the kids probably need a nice two weeks to go recalibrate, that'd give them two weekends, and that just worked best for our calendar and call it a day. I mean, so that, that's why, and then by the way, there's no motion on the table yet or a second. No, motion. there is no, there is no. So you just kind of heard why I would vote no or yeah, so, abstain. So, so it seems to me that in looking at this, the question really, <coughs> really isn't as much the days on the calendar as it is the process of getting the grades to the kids. So I guess my challenge to take back would be, I have no problem with this calendar the way it is, if there was a way that we could solve that, that, well, issue, that issue without changing. The, it, it seems like a, a, a dr drastic thing to have to change the calendar. So, you know, have people come in split weeks, that kind of thing, just because of the pre-existing process of holding the grades until a specific arbitrary day. Well, the, the, diff the challenge with this calendar is, remember when we do a grading day, that's a work day for teachers. Okay. So that has to count as a work day for teachers. So if that's on the first Monday, but that's what I'm saying. Is when, there we come, when, when we come back, if that's the first Monday, then again, we're, we're not m matching up with other districts in the county and when they're taking breaks and and all of that. So you're requiring somebody to come back in on Monday when everybody else is off, right? 
that's what I'm saying. Is yeah. Does it does it require them to come in on the 21st? Does is there some other process? And so it's yeah, we know it, it's 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 um, words are powerful. You know, we we talked about the what, what the, the, the concept of words. We call it a grading day, but it's not truly just a grading day. I will guarantee that the teachers aren't sitting around all day on that Monday, the whatever it is of, of January, calculating grades, putting them in the grade, putting them in power school, whatever. They're doing other things that are important to get ready for the second semester. So I think we're getting hung up on this nuance of, okay, it's grading day and we have to restrict access to whatever for those two weeks because this is our official grading day and this is the way we've always done it. So my, my opinion is, you know, is there another way to look at that rather than, well, if I'm a teacher and I gotta present my grade or guess what, I need to work that next Monday. I'm gonna say whatever it takes. But by, 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 by contract, we have to have a grading day first and second semester. It has to be an entire day just I'm not saying to take that away. I'm just saying that that's, and you know, it's, there it's, are teachers it's who would awesome. say that they use that, you know, that grading day to grade written responses yeah. and exams. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 And that's, that's why we have it is so yeah. that we provide that compensated time where teachers do their grading. So um, I, I hear what you're saying, Jim, that it, it is really, um, it could potentially not be a calendar issue more than a practice issue, but that is a, con a contractual practice. With this calendar, would Power School open up on the fifth, the day after the Green Day? It opened at three p.m. on the fourth. All right. Okay. So on that Green Day. All right. Uh, honestly, I think we've had a lot of conversation. I am. Gonna it's good I'm going to reverse myself and say I'm comfortable. We can at least take it to a vote. Okay. And honestly, I, I want to encourage everybody to vote how you feel. Um, you should. Plain and simple. Uh, depending on the outcome of the vote, vote, we can decide what the next steps are. I'm sure, regardless of the outcome, there will be next steps. Okay, is everybody heard that? So we need a motion. So we need a motion to approve the calendar as presented. Okay, and then a second. Uh, I move to accept the proposed 2020-21 calendar as presented. And I'll second. Okay, all right, roll call. Jackson. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Rudy. Aye. Hessel? Aye. Huber? No. Lundstedt? Aye. Rooney? No. Okay, so motion carries 5-2. Uh, and for the record, I just want to say, I'm perfectly fine with a non-unanimous vote. Okay, in fact, I encourage that because otherwise we don't have these discussions. Right, all right? Now, next steps. Okay, I would ask you guys, this was great discussion. We're very concerned about the impact on students. Okay. I would ask you guys to come back to us and give us some options to mitigate that. Okay, anywhere from, well here's how we're gonna sell it between now and next Christmas, okay? Which gives us a whole year to figure that out. Uh, or whatever else you come up with. And I would actually request also that we include these six in our assessment of options, okay? Frankly, they may come back and say, we'll get over it, okay? Wouldn't it be great if, I don't know what they're going to say. Okay. Uh, their gut feeling is probably going to be, oh my gosh, I can't wait. But let's work out with them, make sure they're fully educated on <coughs> the pros and cons of all the alternatives. Would be a great lunchtime discussion if anybody's looking for a topic on Monday. Um, that might be too soon. Do we have juniors on that? I think they're all seniors. I had a junior last year. Sometimes it just depends on the. Right, which is a good point. Yeah. I would like to challenge you to add some juniors yeah. to yeah. that perspective. Yeah. Okay. So, so while I'll, I'll admit yeah. that because many of us, and I'm going to add my name to the list, missed this subtlety in the calendar, all right, I, and therefore I, I would. I'm going to tell my friends. Yeah. 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 So no. I would have called it to your attention. Therefore, from that perspective, it was not maybe our finest moment. Okay. Agreed. This too, we can use to our long-term benefit and show that in spite of that, um, we'll come out of this ahead, okay? I'm highly confident well, this is all said and done with it now, okay? Yeah. It was, um, it was an excellent discussion. No, this is good. So we I, need to do this. I, I would say, so even though we didn't do it in committee, 
I'd say this was the discussion we would have had in committee. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with, since we didn't have any committee, there's nothing wrong with having the discussion at the board meeting, right? Yeah. Okay. So, we, we couldn't go to committee meeting anyway. Okay. Honestly, um, that's true. You know, no, we couldn't have gone to, our committee meetings go so long anyway, especially the last one. Yeah. yeah we couldn't have gone, we couldn't have this discussion and given tax levy. Yeah, that's you true. That's true. Where are you pointing at me? Because it kind of says you talk too much. You were, let's yeah. be clear. I, 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 think if we, I think if we would have been aware of it, we would have we would have gone a lot longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know yeah. about that. Well, we might have said, when can we come back? And Thank goodness we did spread it. Yeah, nine yeah. o'clock was the witching hour. At the so get my apologies meeting. first. All right, but again, I, I just want to make sure I'm clear. I appreciate that we had that conversation. I appreciate that you brought it up. I want to encourage all of you to bring up issues no matter how uncomfortable they may seem, okay? Um, you know, how many have seen the movie, 12, 12 Angry Men? All right, many times. And it's a good one. And yeah, the play, they did it at Liberty Bell. Is that right? About five years ago. It's called 12 Angry Jurors. Oh, it's a good inclusive. point, and that's a good, good yeah. point as well. That's how they did it at high school. I am forever corrected on that, that's a good point. Okay. I think um, the you set the, set the bar for us up. Yeah, okay. Uh, and I'm glad we did at least take a vote, but we need to fix this problem. Okay, now, just right. communication-wise, so the um, feeder school superintendents know when our recommended breaks were, so our winter holiday and our spring break, they also know that our, on our recommended calendar, that our return date was on the 5th for students, okay, based on that calendar. Because remember, 4th is grading day, 5th is coming back. So as they start to do their calendars, they will probably incorporate something similar to that yes. would be my guess. And I have okay. no, my concerns, which still stand, have nothing to do with when the students return. Uh, but just as in good faith, I voted yes, despite my concerns because of the trust I have in, in you and your committee. Uh, I would just ask that those be, that conversation be had, not having anything to do with what they oh, sure. return. Oh, sure. That, that once we, yeah prove it and it gets released to the bigger districts, we really can't change those parameters. No, we can't. Well, it depends what they do and when they do it. Now, no more, I'm meeting with we don't the leadership on Wednesday. Uh, we have our, our normal like, quarterly lunch. Uh, so calendar, this time of year, calendar is you know, always on that. I mean, the district districts could very well, I don't know what their calendar is, but they could very well be starting later and, and use, then maybe they're gonna go to school until Wednesday. They may go to school until Wednesday. They, they 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 Wednesday. They're not, they're not concerned with family semesters. Right, right, right. Very quickly, Lou, let me ask one more question. Are we, are we unanimous, though, on the idea, no matter what you come up with, you cannot, I'm going to throw out, remove an instructional thing? Yes. Uh, yes, yeah. I would agree with that, because right. I think I'm going to be clear. Because right, I don't want to come back with another alternative and say, you know what, we talked about this, and say, ah, if we give up an instructional, we're okay. So we're saying no. Is there any other guardrail that they've got to deal with? All right, here you go. Going back to school, I mean, August, in August, in August, or, or starting with the process, which I guess that's. Um, so the teachers would have to come back. You pretty much have to have everybody go a day early, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Which means that, that last, that first week of August, which is what we're really we're be trying to protect for everybody, yeah. everybody. And yeah, you will hear percent. more on that. Okay. Believe me. And that, that's what we teach. We get much earlier. Oh. <laughs> All right. Good. Okay. All right. You're still on my report. <laughs> oh, I <laughs> jinxed it too much. Oh, I jinxed it. I, I, I tried to move us along. I tried. <laughs> my fault. I jinxed but you kept tonight. pulling me back. I jinxed us tonight again. I said, I said to John, we won't be long tonight. So I jinxed Okay. Us. So moving right along uh, at. Uh, at uh, PMP committee, uh, we reviewed uh, the performance recognition incentive, which is in our contract, uh, and we have met the criteria uh, for the performance uh, recognition incentive. So the teachers will receive 1.5% uh, on the first Friday in December. Um, is is when they get that, except for Tom. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, and. Um, then uh, what we're also asking you to do is um, our history uh, of this is 
uh, that our belief system in this district has always been that everybody in the district contributes to the success of our students, from um, our custodial maintenance staff, our educational support staff, um, you know, all the way up through uh, the administrative team. And so uh, what we ask for tonight is I am certifying that we've met the performance recognition incentive as reviewed in committee, and we are asking for a motion to authorize payment of that to um, um, all the other employees in the district. I move to authorize the performance recognition incentive. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Carmine Folk. Aye. Rudy. Aye. Kessel. Aye. Huber. Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Rooney? Aye. Batson? Aye. Our motion carries. Okay, uh, LHSF uh, pool parking update. And Mark? In the interest of time, the uh, new pool is done. We're in checklist, so we're going to close out hopefully within the, within the next month or so. So uh, stay tuned on that. We have there's Gilbane has an active team working on completing all those little fine details of corrections and fixing things. Um, and the, the, uh, and the renovations in addition that you see going on, there's a lot of progress being made uh, in all of the areas, but I will say just something you need to be aware of is um, we, are not, we are not sure that the gym will be ready by the start of school for the fall of 2020. So um, seeing what can be made to make up the time between now and then, but the schedule does not look good on that getting done. So that's the area right over there. You can see there's not a lot of walls up, but if you go to the other side, you see several floors of walls up. Um, so there's some of the foundational things that we're working through. So I just wanted to let you know that, but uh, we'll have, we can give you more detailed information in two weeks at our next meeting. So what's the impact on the gym? Negligible. No, I'll tell you the bigger impact is uh, the dance facility. We, we've got some classes that we have proposed with the expectation that they'll be yeah, in that exciting. facility in the fall. So we're already talking about perhaps only offering certain those classes second semester just to give us the buffer that we need there. Is there any way to reposition resources to focus on that even if it's a further delay in the gym? I asked them about that and Because that, that shell is there, right? I mean the problem is they well, you guys should maybe speak. Yeah, that that's that area is really one, well, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but that area is kind of one one unit of construction. And so that, that area is, all, a lot of the things, mechanical systems are all intertwined. And so for that area to reach substantial completion and allow for occupancy, that there's not a there's not a segregation of those spaces. Is that fair? Yes, fair. Yeah. All right. So I'd ask a question anyway. So I get it from an engineering perspective. I guess I just ask, it, if that's the critical part, then I think we should just challenge Gilbane and say, well, what if we took a further delay in the gym with the hope that we can bring the other one on? Maybe it doesn't work, but if that if they had an option, I'd, I'd ask you guys to think because about whether that is. Because the systems are combined. Yeah. OK, I don't know what the critical path on the program is, but maybe that's an option for you, because I'd hate to see us delay program. You could ask the question. Right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, the only, it, it, yeah. maybe you've already asked and they said no. Yeah, I did ask that question. I mean, I, I asked the question, could we start moving on the dance? Okay. Knowing that we already have some slowdown on the gym, and, they, and to both of their points, no, those, the one really can't be finished before the other. They're, they go hand They're in integrated because the they're uh, within the same facility. Yeah. And, and just to, uh, Dan and Mark have touched base on this, but, the, the issues at Vernon Hills is there were underground issues there that were not known and unanticipated, no way to be known uh, there. And so it's taken a lot of extra time on the underground work, um, more than anybody you know would have anticipated, could have anticipated. Um, and we have to have that work done, obviously, to do foundation and then to start to lay black wall and all of that. And you know the weather's going to get pretty Harry later this week already, so, okay. All right, anything else you guys want to add? Okay, um, FOIA request. Um, we received a FOIA request on 10-18-2019. Uh, the commercial response deadline was 11, 2011-19-2019. Requester was Bethany Simpson, data acquisition specialist, smart procure. Um, information requested was all current employee staff contact information. 
Quest has limited to readily available records without physically copying, scanning, or printing documents. Any editable electronic document is acceptable. The specific information requested for your record keeping system is first name, last name, position title, department, employment type, i.e. full-time, part-time, contractor, general office phone number, direct office phone number, business cell phone, if provided by the school district, uh, office fax, email address, office physical address, and office mailing address. Follow-up was done by Brian Kelly, who responded on 10 uh, the time spent was um, several minutes on that. Um, uh, we get these, yeah, we get these from this all the time. So, yeah, uh, which is why it probably took right, not too long a time. Uh, okay, I just have uh, Pat uh, a few uh, others under here just to hit real quick. Uh, the ISBE State School Report Cards will uh, be publicly released on the 30th. Uh, we anticipate, uh, so any information is embargoed until the 30th, but we anticipate that uh, our report cards at both buildings will be, not surprisingly, very favorable, okay? But we just wanted to let you know. Uh, we were reminded you about the um, uh, Foundation Big event. Uh, we also, um, just to reiterate what Pat said again, the committee meetings are on November 4th, Monday. The board meeting is on Monday, November 11th. No, Tuesday. Tuesday, Tuesday. November 11th. No, sorry. Tuesday, 12th. 12th. Okay, sorry. Uh, Tuesday, November 12th. Uh, and then our next meeting won't be until December. And that will be a combined committee and board meeting um, in December. It'll be quick. Yes, it'll be quick. Uh, to Kevin's point, that'll be a quick evening. Wait, I gotta see you guys the next three weeks in a row. You do. Then you gotta wait six <laughs> weeks. It's like you gotta wait for six, six weeks. weeks. December and then December 9th. Yeah. Then you get a big break. <laughs> so it's just like finishing bargaining, <laughs> Kevin. Um, then we get a big break for a couple of years, okay. and then we get you know we get to have the discussion. Uh, and I think that's it, Mary. Did I miss anything? And I got Rita's piece there. Okay, Pat. That concludes the very. That's probably the longest in-depth superintendent's report for tonight. Okay, next, uh, can I ask for a motion to approve the consent vote agenda as listed with the exception of we're going to remove item 3B um, and come back and approve that in the next meeting? Yeah, just a quick note on that with uh, Caroline passing and traveling, there's nothing substantive, just a couple of edit changes, so we just wanted to clean up a couple of things. So that's the only reason we'll just bring it back. You know, next time around. Okay. I move. I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Rudy. Aye. Hassel. Aye. Huber. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Okay. Motion carries. Next, the facilities and finance committee chairperson. Okay. So we did meet as a group on uh, Monday, October 14th. We did a tour of LHS, field house, the old pool, and certain classrooms. Uh, we also talked a little bit solar, but most importantly, we talked about the tax levy. And with that, I will turn it over to our, I mean, you're not the CFO, you're assistant, but it doesn't matter. The, the finance guy. Yeah. Well, uh, the man. We just call him the man. So uh, our levy information was presented, the estimate was presented at the committee meeting. Uh, right now we're anticipating it would be, you have a CPI of 1.9. With new construction, you're getting closer to a 2.3. Uh, however, I told you about the assessment information that is still, we're waiting for. Uh, we are still waiting for that information, unless you all got your assessment notices and no one else told me. Um, so that is still deeply concerning to me in terms of the timing for everything later in the spring for in terms of tax bills, uh, so the county has a massive amount of work in front of them. Uh, I think Libertyville is hoping to get published uh, maybe sometime this week or so, and Vernon will probably be uh, a bit later. So we're, I'm trying to be in touch. Uh, I, was, I was talking to our township, one of our township assessors today uh, and talking with the county. We've gotten preliminary information from the county, uh, but there was an asterisk that said if you're in uh, Libertyville, or Libertyville or Vernon townships, which are the two townships we're in, um, the information is very preliminary. So we have a preliminary estimate for new construction at about 17.5 million, which is definitely higher than average. 
Uh, but what I don't have is any detail about what those are or anything like that. So I'm trying to get information. It'll be, it'll be very important to get as much information as I can in the next two weeks to know. So where are we at in terms of our levy? Um, we would typically, with a $300,000 cushion, be at a 2.7% levy. At this point, I still think I would recommend a three to give us the, the cushion because there's a lot of unknown, there's more inf unknown information this year than we've had in previous year, pretty much that we've had in my entire career of doing this. And so um, that's, I think, where we're, where we're sitting. We'll talk more next week in our committee meeting with the most current information that I have at that time. All right, so just run through the whole process. So at the last committee meeting, you introduced it. We talked about an hour. Then you had what recommendations for the last committee meeting? Uh, I, my recommendation at that point would have been a 2.7 in a typical year. Okay. Um, meaning we could have had a 2.7, which would have given us enough cushion based mm -hmm. on the information we have. Due to the amount of information we have, I think a three is probably what I would recommend, which a three has been in line with what we've done. We'll only get probably end up being two, somewhere between 2.3 and 2.5, but we don't know. There's a lot of unknowns right and now. And we'll talk about it at the next committee meeting. Yes. And for final approval at the following board meeting. Correct. So we're looking for final approval at the November 12th board meeting. Thank you. Okay. If possible, we can go into December, but I'd rather not in case we can't get a quorum in December. That would be uh, devastating. Questions on the tax levy? Anything else under F and F? Great. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank, you, uh, thank you, Dr. Grudy. We got, have a couple things here. We have uh, a list of uh, employment of employees, and these are all uh, coaching positions that have come in since our, uh, our um, committee meeting earlier in the month. So we just need a uh, motion to uh, approve. A motion to approve the employment of employees. Uh, I'll second any, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, any comments, questions on these? Okay, roll call, please. Hessel? Aye. Huber? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Rooney? Aye. Batson? Aye. Carmichael? Aye. Rooney? Aye. Okay, motion passes. We have two board policies for a second reading. We've gone through these in committee. We went through them as first reading last uh, month at the board meeting. Um, nothing has changed since that point in time, so I think we've all had a chance to, to look at these. Uh, can we have a motion, please? Move to accept the board policy, second reading, and adopt them. Uh, policy 430 and policy 6240. Second. Okay, any further comments or questions on these? I do. Okay. I don't know why I'm bothered by this, but I've been going back and forth uh, with Brian about it. Uh, the one board policy about field trips and educational tours uh, and the, the use of the word prior. So the superintendent gives us prior approval or if it's more than 200 miles or overnight, then it requires the board approval. And I would like to find a way of having language that doesn't require us to have exceptions because there will be times where a team will win an event that allows them to advance to some place like Springfield where they're outside of 200 miles, but there won't be a board meeting that will allow us to give prior approval. So the suggestion is, well, we'll just go ahead and let, go ahead and let them do it, and then we'll talk about it afterwards. Couldn't we have a policy that allows for that exception to be stated? So, so what was the outcome of the discussion between you and? Do you want to take it? Um, so I, I mean, you can leave it the way it's written, just by your approval, and just know that a competitive activity or a team may qualify, and, and you, you're not going to have prior approval just because of timing of it. But by leaving it prior, you're we're setting the the idea that you know you want to. We want everything to have prior approval when, when it can be. All right, so let, let me make so sure I have I a thought yeah. that we change it, and instead of it saying all field trips must have the superintendent or designee's prior approval, except that field trips beyond 200 mile radius 
uh, of the school or extending overnight must have um, prior approval of the Board of Education. I suggest that we strike, accept that, and add, and in addition. So all field trips and, uh, must have the superintendent or designee's prior approval, and in addition, field trips beyond a 200 mile radius of the school and setting overnight must have board approval instead of having that prior there. That way, you would have to have the superintendent's prior, prior approval, approval, but we can approve it afterwards. But we can approve it afterwards. Prior. That way it takes care of all of the contingencies and we don't have to have a board policy that two or three years down the road we have to reinterpret. Brian, I would be okay with that. Yeah. Can we make that change? So can we so agree to that change now and, and approve that policy with that change? Do you want to time to think about it first? Or? Well, we can, we can approve it with, it, yeah. with that change. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. The change is noted. Right. So the worst case scenario is we'd have to come back and approve it again. Right. So I think it's important to get the other language cleaned up. Yeah. We, should, we should make sure we have that. Can you read that again? Make sure Carol has that. And then. Yeah. You want me to just send it to you? Or yeah. Do you want me to read it out loud? So we should I think I got it, but I'm not looking at it. Some we have it on the record. Yeah. All field trips must have the superintendent or designee's prior approval, and in addition, Field trips beyond a 200 mile radius of the school or extending overnight must have the approval of the Board of Education. So, can we get a, a new motion? Let's we'll do that again just to clarify. So, let's just say the first sentence was all field trips. It's actually one sentence in the original, yeah. and I, all I did was strike, accept that, right. and put in, and in addition. And, and then I got rid of the prior. second prior. Second prior. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't have to give prior approval. Carol, you will have to. Um, yeah, I think so. <laughs> I know it all sounds convincing. All right, well, no, let's do it again. Let's vote again. Um, all right, because at this point, we're gonna, we, I guess we have two options. We either can vote on the, 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 the motion was to approve as is. So we either have to reject that motion or amend it. Yeah, so that would be amending the motion. Yeah, yeah. 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 So just ask her if she'll accept the amendment. Will you accept the amendment? I will accept the amendment. So now we're looking for so an motion, amendment. The motion now, yes, yeah, so to accept the two policies for approval as okay. amended. Amendment. Yes. And the amendment's clear, right? Carol? Yep. Well, we have it on video. Yes. All right. Karen, your point that language and words mm -hmm. matter yeah. once again. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> You know, let's see how this could catch. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Is so we had a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. That's good. Uh, roll call, please. Huber? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Bruni? Aye. Batson? Aye. Carmichael? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Kessel? Aye. Motion <coughs> passes. Uh, that concludes the uh, program of personnel. All right, so you know. Okay, just a couple updates. First of all, um, we got a uh, notification from the superintendent of CEDAL that I think we think we actually was kind of the beginning of a lot of review of practices uh, because uh, a student who told the parents about uh, how they were being treated in school um, did lead to the arrest uh, today of, or yesterday of uh, one of the former paraprofessionals uh, for six misdemeanor counts of reckless conduct. So just that's that's kind of the end of the sheriff's, you know, that's where the investigation ended up for that particular uh, employee. And um, yeah, the other you know, good news is that the uh, staffing shortage is being addressed. Two of the schools that have had freezes have now opened those uh, to more students. They're still working on the gauges like, but I believe it's about a 50% um, and when they, you know, they're working really, really diligently to try to fill those gaps and make everything work more smoothly. So hopefully the outcome of all this will be, it'll be um, well run and it's going to be safe. And uh, anyway, those things are up there. Okay. Measure progress. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. there was an article in the uh, Daily Herald about the yeah. staffing thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Which is good news. All right. Um, ISB? Yeah, just real quick. Tomorrow evening is the, um, the <coughs> ISB uh, dinner meeting uh, called at the uh, 
double tree is it in, uh, in Mundelein. So I will be attending that. I didn't know if anyone else had signed up for that. Um, if you're interested, who's the speaker? Just What's that? Is there a speaker? Yeah, there's a speaker, uh, Ralph um, Martire. Martire. Oh, Martire. Yeah. Martire. Yeah. Martire. Yeah. Martire. Yeah. Executive Martire. Director for Tax and Budget Accountability at the uh, uh, at uh, Roosevelt University. He's uh, the topic is moving Illinois toward fiscal fiscal sustainability. I believe it's it starts pretty early. I believe it starts like five thirty. Yeah. If you want to go, let Carol know. Yeah. We'll yeah. come over and see if we can get you. Yeah, and yeah. then, of course, a lot of the brain behind the VF. Uh, uh, Kevin, you know Ralph. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's, he's very proud. He's great. Yeah, Ralph is really good. And the other thing is, Ralph is a sitting school board president. So he's also on his local school board. So he's a, he's a finance professional. He's really well known and acknowledged. And he's, he's, he's just very um, common sense. He's a good <coughs> If you haven't been to one of these events, they're really usually pretty good, and you get to meet a lot of other, I mean, it's just a room full of board members and a, and a handful of administrators, yeah. uh, and they're all from around the area, so it's all big counties. And it's right down the road, you yeah, know, it's in right. uh, Double Tree and Monday morning, so. All right, okay. anything else? All right, so um, can I ask for a motion to move into executive session? Again, topic tonight is employment of an employee is Black ILCS 120 slash 2C1. So Second. 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 Roll call, please. Uh, Lundstedt, aye. Rudy, aye. Batson, aye. Carmichael, aye. Rudy, aye. Kessel, aye. Just Huber, aye. All right, motion carries, and again, we will not be taking any further action after the discussion tonight. Thanks. Good night, everybody.